The study tonight will be on Revelation chapter 3, the Church of Laodicea. We'll finish that off tonight. But I also um, did want to tell you a couple of things that have been on my radar lately. Is uh, And I, I had a video, but I, I can't play it today. I'll let you guys watch it, but maybe we'll put it up somewhere. And it's in Israel, and it's quite interesting. Israel, of course, one of the most uh, uh, sought, sought out places for vaccination. So a lot of people are looking to Israel as the gold standard for vaccinations for this virus. So they got a lot of people vaccinated. They got, uh, um, I, think they, I think they started with Pfizer, AstraZeneca. Yeah. So they got a lot of stuff going on in there. And um, there's been some controversy because the, the humanitarian uh, committee in Helsinki uh, was protesting that they were basically not telling Israelis that this was a basic experimental vaccine and they were just putting it on people. But that's besides the point. Uh, we got a lot of people vaccinated. And now you see in Israel, and I forget where the city was, uh, but I've seen a video in, from Israel where uh, if you have a vaccination, if you, if you do get the vaccine, you're allowed to come in uh, into the shop, into the whatever you're going in, shop, shopping mall or something. And uh, so you have to show your, your certificate that you've been vaccinated. Uh, if you can't get in, if you don't have one, you can't get in. And, uh, and if you do get in, because you have the, the, the passport thingy, uh, then they'll put a little star on you that you're, you're, you're good, you come in. And if you don't have one, then you can't get in. But if you do, you do have one, you can get in, but you gotta have a little star that they put on you. Then you can purchase, buy, sell, whatever you need to do within the shopping center. And um, that's for merchants, that's for customers. So uh, you can kind of see where that is going. And of course, in England, in the UK, there was a, um, an incident that happened at a store, a grocery store. Uh, forget the name of the grocery store at this from Robinson's or something. I forget, I forget what it is. And uh, there was an older man who didn't have a mask and he didn't want to wear it for health reasons. He couldn't wear one. And um, well, they, they gave him a, a yellow star to put it on because accommodations, special accommodations. And uh, he had to walk around the store basically with the star saying he was a special accommodation. And um, so you can kind of see the marking of people becoming a, a trend. I'm not saying any, any of these things are the total end of it. But I will tell you this, that there will come a time when that would be a necessity. There'll be some kind of permission, whether it's a, uh, just a permit, whether it's a, an actual currency itself. Uh, but the Bible does speak about those, uh, that, that event where uh, the Antichrist will have so much power and he will roll out the, the false prophet, will roll out the, uh, the mark. And based on worship and based on uh, adoration of the Antichrist, and people will be able to buy or sell or trade with uh, some kind of mark, some kind of permission. So whatever that may be, people have speculated on it. There's many, many things to, uh, to speculate on. We don't ultimately know what it is, but you can kind of see the world in the trajectory, the trends, how it might look like when you have things like health and finance and all these things being set up um, as a mark. Uh, to let you in shopping centers or not. That's, yeah, John. It's kind of amazing that the Jews would actually do that in Israel because they were marked with a star. Yeah. In the Holocaust. I know, it's and weird. They had to wear a star. Yeah. A lot of people are not happy. A lot of Jews are not happy with it, but that's just the, uh, they have an election coming up in March. And Netanyahu is trying to do all that he can to come out on top. And I think this is one of the reasons why they're doing it. It's just that to show that he's really ahead of the game. He's ahead of the curve and, uh, you know, even Biden uh, praised Netanyahu that he's, uh, not, not Biden, sorry, uh, Fauci, uh, praised him that he's a model of what the way prime ministers are to be and handle things and blah, 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 and how he vaccinated the majority of the people now. And, uh, but Israel's got a lot of problems. There's, they have a 22 for the per capita. They have one of the largest rising uh, uh, families in poverty. It's about, it's almost 20, 20, 22 percent, I think it is now. Bad. It's really bad. Uh -huh. And you can kind of see where situations where people are hungry, people are starving, people need food, people need jobs, that um, they would do anything to, you know, to, to get back on their feet, including even, um, you know, obviously uh, some kind of vaccination, some kind of, because they need to go to work. And, uh, uh, you know, people are not going to, people are going to say, well, I can't fault them. They need to work. You know, and uh, but like John said, it's interesting how they would just take a star and they just do it. But anyway, in England, uh, the reverse happened. It was actually someone who didn't want to wear the mask 
was tagged. And, I, and apparently, I think at Trader Joe's, they do that now a little bit. Oh, yeah. That uh, if you don't want to wear a mask, they give you a little shopping cart with the big flag on it. Really? So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll do yeah. the flag. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that says uh, special oh, yeah. accommodations. Now, I'm not saying any, any of these things are funny, right? In some way, it's it kind of it is funny, though. A little weird, but yeah, you, you get a little shopping cart and it has a flag that says special accommodation. Oh, and um, it's like public shaming. yeah, to a degree, yeah, it sounds like. uh, yeah. And the other one was in England, they're going also going to have this, uh, it's called uh, for true, true something. Hold on, um. It's a digital passport that's coming out pretty soon. Uh, this, uh, this, it's called Trust Framework. And Trust Framework will be implemented, if it passed, by Boris Johnson, if it passed, it'll inc include health, political affiliation, religious affiliation, financial records, all in this digital passport, this digital card that you'll be able to uh, basically be recognized as a UK citizen. This is Trust Framework. Uh, a lot of pressure on Johnson from other uh, ministers from England. You know, they have a parliamentary democracy, so it's the equivalent of senators in Congress putting pressure on the, on the president to, uh, to get this done. So the government intends to implement this digital identity network trust framework. And uh, we need to pray. We need to pray because uh, if, if, it, if it does come true, if it does pass, it'll, it will be implemented, I believe, first of all, in the Western English-speaking countries like Canada, U.S., Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa. They will be implemented there and then rolled out maybe to the rest of the world as part of the plan of trust framework. So uh, it could be something, it could be nothing, but nonetheless, if they're including that much records in your in an, an ID card, there's a lot to be said about that. And um, so we have to be praying for the believers in England. How do those records come together? How do they do all that? Well, I think they're going to pull them from everywhere. You're going to have to put them in. You're going to have to uh, basically put all the records yeah, in, your health records, financial records. I mean, it's yeah. easy to do now with, uh, because of uh, everything's on the Internet. If you have yeah, a bank account, it's on the Internet. All you need to do is it's through APIs and connected to uh, an app or some sort. Uh, they're very sophisticated apps now that can do that. So anyway, much to pray about, much to deal with, but you're seeing the... Uh, the effects of how quickly something can change, rather quickly. In about a year, we went from a, you know, a lockdown to, you know, we didn't know what to do with this virus, to uh, nobody gets out, nobody goes to work, complete shutdown of the economy, great reset, vaccinations, nobody goes back to work, and if you have a vaccination, you still need to wear your mask and do all this stuff. And it's a very convenient virus. It's a very convenient virus because it's really allowed the governments of the world to really do what they always wanted to do, control, change the economy, get rid of debt that they incurred themselves. It's called uh, government debt, which is incredible amounts in the, in the trillions, not just the U.S., but Europe, China. And um, they get a chance to write it off and, uh, and be done with it and pass out more stimulus and uh, eventually uh, change, change currencies, change the times, change the laws. And... You know how 9-11 changed a lot of the laws. It, you know, we went from a private citizens to complete no liberty. You know, Patriot Act basically can hold you uh, without, you know, without a trial. They can just, uh, on suspicion, um, they can check you at the airport. All kinds of stuff changed after 9-11. Now, another change is going to happen. Another change will happen after this because everything's going to be uh, really controlled, really controlled by governments and, and despots and, and, and yet, economically, you know, people are going to be financially hurt after all this. So, um, and, but you see, they create the problem, <laughs> they create the panic, they give you the solution, and now you've got to buy into it. That's the way, remember, the, 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 the world's under the power of the wicked one. That's really the reality. What's behind all this is the power of the wicked one. Yet, God says it in his word. It'll happen a certain way. It'll have to go a certain way, but... Uh, those who know their God will carry out great exploits. It says in the book of Daniel, yeah. those who know their God. Um, you know, these things are concerning, but these things are not to shake us and frighten us to the core. Yeah. And um, right. Hallelujah. You know, our God is uh, greater than what the world offers. Right. And, and even if the world offers, like it offered Jesus, Satan offered Jesus the kingdoms of this world. You know, he said there's only one God. There's only one truth. And there's only one God that we have to worship, and no one else will deserve the glory and the praise. And, Amen. And um, Antichrist will try to seek after it.
for sure, just like the devil does. Um, uh, but there'll be those who don't, don't worship and will overcome them by uh, the blood of the cross, the blood of the Lamb, and the power of their testimony. So it, it's, and they did not count their lives uh, to be dear to themselves. They didn't really, uh, it wasn't about them, it was about the Lord and about what the Lord was doing. So let's pray because we got Revelation 3 tonight and uh, it's only one church, Laodicea, but that's, that would be enough, right? Uh, lots to say about Laodicea. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Bless those who came. Bless those who are uh, listening online. And we ask you, Lord, to uh, bless our time together, opening your word, centered around you, putting Jesus right in the middle of our study, in the middle of our prayers. And we pray, Lord, that through your spirit, we'll be able to draw near to you and draw near to one another. And so, Lord, we ask you that your words may be clear tonight and that you help us understand an important text for us because you've given us what not to do in this case and so that we wouldn't have to fall prey and fall to a trap that it so easily could happen, Lord, the Laodicea lukewarmness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Turn to Luke, uh, Luke, Revelation 3. Thank you, Luke. Verse 14. <laughs> Verse 14, all the way to 22. Go ahead, John. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have prospered, I am need of nothing, not realizing that you are wretched. Pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire, so that you may be rich and white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see those who I love and reprove and discipline. Be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If, any, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father's on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Amen. Very interesting letter. In all the other letters, we find Jesus right in the middle of the lampstands, right in the middle of the church. That's where he's uh, from Revelation 1. He walks in the midst of the lampstands, midst of the churches. Where's Jesus in this letter? Outside. Outside. Right? So right away, we got a problem. <laughs> Jesus is not in the midst of this church, Right? As Lance pointed out, he's outside. When you got Jesus outside uh, the fellowship area, uh, that's a problem. He should be in the midst of it. He's the center of it. He's the, the whole reason why we gather. But when he's in the outside, he's knocking, and he's trying to get in, uh, something has happened, right? And um, by the way, it's a lot easier to prevent things from happening than it is to reverse them, right? It is easier yes. to prevent things from happening than it is to reverse them, like anything. It's easier to prevent Jesus from going outside the church than trying to reverse it and say, well, now that Jesus is outside, how can we get him back in? The thing is, keep it from happening. Amen. Laodicea had gone too far. Laodicea had gone too far, but yet Jesus was still knocking. Mm -hmm. Jesus was still eager to meet with them and talk to them. But the worst part, what was the worst part about Laodicea? What's they, one thing that is mentioned about their... They didn't know. They didn't know. They did not realize their spiritual blindness. They didn't know Jesus was outside. Jesus had to tell them, hey, I'm outside. They thought things were going well. And this letter is one letter that we can see how it could prevent us from things happening to us like that. It's one of the reasons we read the seven letters to the seven churches. If we can see what the Lord is saying, 
we can uh, prevent this from happening. So the big problem in the church today is how to overcome this. How to overcome this. If there was an attack on the church, or you specifically, if there was an attack, meaning for your faith, it would be a lot easier to defend yourself, right? Because you know that you're being attacked. It's a lot easier to say, hey, this is happening. I need to kind of ward off or need to, need to make some changes. But the slow, slow indifference, the lukewarmness that sits in, it's a lot more difficult to deal with. Now, why, why, why would I say that? Why is it easier to say it's easier to know that you're being attacked rather than, than to know that, uh, than, than, than the indifference of lukewarmness, right? Uh, what's one difference? If you're being attacked, then you could... Something tangible? Yeah, you prepare. You could, you could make a change. You can know, hey, I'm being persecuted. But if it's indifference on your part, if it's lukewarmness, it's a lot more difficult to deal with because you don't know it's setting in. You don't know, yeah, especially if you're blind. Uh, it's hard to see how deadly blindness could be. It's hard to see. Um, there's no sign of persecution. As, as you read the letter, you, you see that Jesus doesn't uh, acknowledge anything about persecution, like he did with Smyrna, like he did with uh, Philadelphia, right? Uh, they were actually doing pretty well. If you interviewed uh, the church, they would actually tell you, What's wrong with us? We're actually doing well. Mm-hmm. There's, nothing, there's, there's nothing wrong. We got, we got a nice church. We got everybody coming in. And uh, the danger is we can choose to live that way. We can choose to live in a lifestyle that does not have any threats to our Christian life. That means that uh, we can choose to live in such comfort and such uh, leisure that it doesn't. you'll never be affected by anything. You just want to... Uh, basically put it on cruise control and go on with your life and go on with the easiness of the Christian life and forget what we are called to do and forget what we're called to do. This is what happened to Laodicea. They forgot what we were called to do. Now, what are we called to do? Just There's lots of things, right? But you can put them all in, in, in compartments. What's one thing that we can, we've been called to do? Yeah. Worship God. Worship God. What else? Make disciples. Make disciples. Witness. Witness. Okay. Anyone else? Love the brethren. Love the brethren, right? Mm-hmm. Anything else? Just serve. Serve. Okay. Does any of those things come easy? No. 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 There's friction. There's contention. Right. There's there's problems. Not everybody's lovable. First of all, right? <laughs> including you, right? <laughs> right. Not everybody's lovable, including me. Uh, not everybody's easy to serve, right? Not everybody wants to serve. Um, what else? Not everybody wants to worship God. There may be a cost to worship God. You may live in a place where it's not welcomed. Uh, what else did we say? Make disciples, you know? Not everybody wants to listen. Not everybody cares. So all those things are part of that. But if you choose not to do any of that, you can actually live as a Christian, right? And, and not do any of those things and just go to church, live a very comfortable Western life, you know, Western culture life, and not ever have to worry about any of those things, not ever have to worry about discipleship, not ever have to worry about, you know, witnessing, not ever have to worry about serving, you can just cruise, right? And this is what happened to Laodicea. They forgot what we are, what they were called to do. Now, the church is called many things. The church is called a house, the church is called a family, this church, even in the, in, in, in the book of Acts, is called the temple, Paul body. talks about it too, right? A body, body, right? A bride. What's another one? Ecclesia. Ecclesia? I'm looking for one that, that we're studying with the men on Monday. Come on, An army. An army, that's right. Lance is right. It's called an army. It's called an army. It's called soldiers. And uh, it's the life of a soldier pretty easy? No. Not at all. Not at all. And, and the Bible even tells you that uh, a soldier must uh, not get entangled in the affairs of this world. And uh, but you have to be uh, committed to the one who enlisted you. The Lord enlisted you. And uh, you can't get tangled with things in the affairs of this world. It must endure hardship. And nobody likes to read that, right? Because, hey, what about my leisure Christian life? And I want that Western <laughs> Christian life. 
that, uh, by the way, it only works in places that are very affluent, by the way. Uh, thank God we don't live in a very affluent place, right? Is that, you know, am I right? Thank God we don't live in a very affluent culture. As you're drinking Perrier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With an iPad, right? <laughs> At least I got a torn up Bible, so. It looks, it looks rugged. It looks, it's, it's, uh, uh, the danger is, for us, it's exactly that. The danger is the culture can become part of your faith. You can integrate the culture. You can integrate how people live and into your faith and, and say, well, that's just the way it is. That's just the way we live. Now, there's nothing wrong with having things. That's not my point. There's nothing wrong with having things. There's something wrong if those things have you and those things control you and you view your faith through the lenses of the culture, through the lenses of the leisure and the comfort that it offers in the, in the Western world. We don't recognize it that much until we go to a, a country that doesn't have the affluence that we have. Even the people that we visited today, mm -hmm. by most standards, they're very well off. By most standards, by most standards of the world, mm -hmm. they're very well off, even in their condition. Then I go home, and I go, oh Lord, what about me? <laughs> if, if those people that we visited today, if we say that they're not that bad off, you know, they got meals, they got showers, they got, you know, they got a library, they got a lot of things. They got, you know, medical things, equipment, people that love them and care for them. But what about me? I have more than that. They have the basics. I have more than that. Can I fall to pray? Can I fall prey to those things as part of my culture, as part of my environment? Can I fall prey to that? Without a doubt, my friend. And so if there was anything, if there was ever a letter written to not just Christians, but the Western Christian churches mm -hmm. in the last days, it's this one, the letter to Laodicea. Now, if we follow, to, if we follow correctly timelines and history, we're dealing with the last church in church history. The last church in church history in terms of overall church. I'm not saying one specific church, but overall Christendom, the overall uh, church body. Uh, this is the last church in terms of history before Jesus returns. Jesus said, will I even find faith on the earth? You know, uh, the faith, the faith, in, the faith in Jesus. Now, there's a lot of people who are going to say they have faith, but then faith in who? Yeah. Right? Faith in Jesus. So, the lifestyle that Laodicea had is very similar. We could attest to that. We can even relate to it more than any other place. You know, I, 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 by the grace of God, I visited believers in different parts of the world, poor believers, very poor. And, um, you know, I always come back and tell people, you know, we're well off. We're well, well off. And uh, when Jesus spoke about woe to those who are rich, woe to those who are at ease, woe to those who have comfort, uh, I think in a lot of ways the Bible was speaking to us. I was speaking to those in that culture, of course, who were off, well off and at ease, but also speaks of those who are well off and at ease today. And, um, but also the, the idea, the mindset, right, of just wanting to have things that will give us more leisure, give us more pleasure, give us more entertainment, right? We, we live in an entertainment-saturated society. That's really all we want is to be entertained. And I say we because I'm part of, you know, being an American, being in the Western culture. Uh, that's the biggest draw, right? If it's entertaining, if it's comfortable, if it's leisure, it's, uh, it gets gold stars, right? It gets thumbs up from everybody. But if it's hard, if it's difficult, if it's, you know, a little bit more than what I want to put into, then maybe it doesn't draw a lot of people in. And so this is, this is our culture. Anyway, Laodicea. Let me tell you a little bit about the city itself, and you can kind of see how parallel it is to our Western world. Uh, and more than anything, what Jesus said about this church, right? One of the things that Jesus said about it was the lukewarmness, the lukewarmness, right? Mm -hmm. The cold, the hot, and the lukewarmness. Well, mm -hmm. a lot of what Jesus said has to do with how they would have understood it in their first century setting. We call it the Sitzenleben. Sitzenleben just simply means the setting in which they were in. And each one of these letters carries a lot of historical implication to their time. Meaning these, they would know what Jesus was talking about. 
I remember I told you the, 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 the Church of Philadelphia, how Jesus talked about the name. I put my name. I put my father's name. I put the name of the city of my God, the name of my God. And, well, Philadelphia went through a period of time where they changed the name five or six times. The city changed names. And uh, so it corresponded to that. It corresponded to how Philadelphia understood it. The people there, the, the, the people that actually went to that church and lived in that city would have understood that is Jesus is talking about us because our city has changed names. God's going to give us a new name eventually. It would, it would have spoken to them a little bit more than to us. Uh, or when uh, the church of Sardis, uh, Jesus talks about for them to be alert, to wake up and don't let anybody rob you, right? Don't let anybody steal from you. Don't, you know, be alert. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain. Uh, well, it happened in Sardis. In history, they were robbed two times, uh, majorly, by soldiers falling asleep at the, at the entrance. They breached the entrance. Twice it happened. And uh, Jesus is speaking to them as they knew exactly what had happened to their city. They, were, they lived in an impenetrable city. It was up on a cliff. It was almost impenetrable to go up there. There was only one way to get in, and it's through a little ravine, and you have to cross over. And you can still see it today. And um, there's soldiers there, but if the soldiers are not falling asleep, I mean, if the soldiers are falling asleep, then the enemy can get in. And Jesus said, hey, wake up and strengthen the things that remain. Well, they knew what that was. So here, Laodicea, same thing. The water was a big issue for Laodicea. Laodicea lived in a very, um, you know, affluent area, and they had water supplies. One of the water supplies was just south of them, and there's a letter written to the church of Colossae, the church of the Colossians, the church in, in Colossae. Uh, they had a water supply there, and it was very fresh, beautiful water, nice water, things you want to drink. Kangen water. Uh, Kangen water, yeah. <laughs> that was not an advertisement, by the way. Um, and uh, so they would bring the water from Colossae. Well, up in the hills, just north of uh, Laodicea, was a place called Hariopolis. Hariopolis, and um, it's called Pamukkala today. Pamukkala, up in the hills in Turkey, and that there's a volcanic area there in Pamukkala. And actually, just look it up today. You can go and just Google it, and it looks like snow, but it's actually not snow. It's minerals. It's like a mountain full of minerals, and it looks white as snow. It's beautiful. Well, today, people go there for one reason only. Salt bath. Therapeutic bath. Yeah, because the water is hot, it's warm, they have these hot springs, they have mineral bath, incredible. People go there to leisure, I guess, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. People go there. You, you look it up on Google and you're like, man, is this is snow? No, it's just the mountains of Turkey. There's this volcanic area, Pamukkala, and there's all these hot springs there, still to this day. Well, the water travels from Pamukkala down to Laodicea, and they were able to get water from... Colossi, fresh water from Colossi to Laodicea. So you got two water sources, one hot, one cold. Both very good. I mean, what's, what's, hot, what's uh, hot water good for? Tea. Tea? Number one answer. <laughs> Coffee? Soup. Soup? <laughs> Bath. Bath. What's that? Bath. Bath, yeah. Therapy, right? A lot of, a lot of that, right? Hot springs. Beautiful. Now, what the, uh, what's cold water good for? Drinking. If you like cold bath, right? There's a lot of good reasons to. But fresh water, a refreshment. I mean, it's just, yeah, cool off. It's hot in there. It's in Turkey, man. Right? It's hot. Uh, and those things in and of itself are good. They're very good. Something happened to Laodicea. They made a mistake in the aqueduct, and the water mixed. And the water mixed. Unfortunately, it didn't get cold and it didn't stay hot, it became lukewarm. Uh, and tradition, yeah, tradition, you ever had lukewarm coffee? <laughs> yeah. But it's even worse than that. Because of the minerals in the water that comes from Pamukkala, if you ever, uh, I don't know if they do that anymore, but they used to do it to make it, yeah, food poisoning. Uh, now they pump your stomach and things like that. But it, the old ways, it used to make you drink warm mineral water. And warm mineral water causes you to hurl, causes you to throw up, causes, you know, because the, the minerals, when they look warm, some reason or another, it doesn't digest really well, and it causes a regurgitation. 
And that's how they used to like, you know, treat you <laughs> if you had food poisoning. And mineral oils. Yeah. yeah, that's right. If you drink a lot of, oh, that you brought yes, memories sir. back. Sorry. <laughs> Tell you what they used to give me. And um, yeah, but that's what happened. So in Laodicea, it was tradition that you would let the hot water cool all the way down to the temperature, cold water temperature, and then you can drink the mineral water at a cold temperature. And that did not cause you to throw up. But if you drank it lukewarm, believe me, everyone's going to know it. And that's what Jesus says. You have mixed two things. You have created a mixture. You're not hot. You're not cold. I wish you were, but you are lukewarm. And I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. You're so disgusting. I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. These are tough words, right? To, to hear Jesus say, you disgust me. I am going to throw up. Um, it means something, right? It means something to cause a reaction. That cause of a reaction from our Lord to, to say that. But why would Jesus use such a, such a graphic view? I mean, you see, can you see Jesus throwing up? I can see Jesus weeping. Well, because right? he's outside. Right? Yeah, he's I can not see. There no more. Yeah, but can, what a gra- But w- what's that it's to that them? Bad. Right. It's that bad, and it's a shocking thing. I mean, to hear Jesus say, so "I'm, I'm pretty sick of you, and you make me throw up." That is some statement from our Lord to say, "Wait a minute, Lord, are we, Lord, is it I? Have I gone that far? Have I insulted you, Lord?" Right? It was to get their attention, you know? Because yeah. everybody expected you, oh, you know, it's all right. You got some things you work on and things like that. But when he's really graphic on this, you're th- I'm gonna, you make me throw up. It is to say, wake up. Something needs to change. You can't continue down the same road. So anyway, we'll get to that. But the trade route was amazing. They sat, they sat near the, uh, the Meander River. The Meander River, it's not too far from Laodicea. And the trade routes were in, impressive, to say the least. They were very, very wealthy. In fact, they were so wealthy, they had a medical school. They had a medical school, guess for what? Minerals. Minerals. An eye school, that's oh, right. That's right. Yeah, and what does Jesus say about them? Oh, They're blind. blind. They need eye salve. They need ointment. You can't see. You can't see that you're blind, wretched, and naked, right? You're miserable, blind, wretched, naked, right? You can't see it. Take a, take a lesson from your own culture. You have an eye school. <laughs> you have a medical school that deals with eyes, and you can't even see. Because it's not the physical eyes that you need. You need spiritual eyes. Kind of like what Jesus said to the Pharisees, right? The, the blind, you know, remember the blind man that he healed? <laughs> He could see, but the other ones who could see were the ones who were blind. The blind guy knew. The blind guy knew who Jesus was. <laughs> and he got his eyesight back. And the, the guys who could see, the Pharisees, they were just as blind. But they were not physically blind. They were spiritually blind, which is worst. They also had uh, a, great, a great harvest, a great collection of black sheep. Black sheep. And black sheep produces black wool. Now, I don't know if that interests you anymore, but in in the ancient culture, it was very expensive. It was very expensive to own uh, black wool from black sheep. And um, and obviously, the superstition of the day, uh, the superstition of the day, it was related to death. And if you had black wool, then you wouldn't die. And then you would become very prosperous. Mm -hmm. You'd become very prosperous. So uh, everybody wanted their latest and greatest black coat <laughs> and black sheep produce black wool and what does Jesus talk about the most in this, uh, in, in this particular letter clothing you're naked <laughs> you need garments yeah now they weren't physically naked they were worse than physically naked they had no garments that's right they had no garments of salvation they had no garments of salvation which Jesus was ready to give them. Now, they had lots of earthquakes, and the last earthquake happened about 30 years before this letter was written, and it was destroyed. Uh, But they were so well off, they told Rome, don't send us money, Caesar. We will rebuild the city ourselves. We have no need of you. We have no need of your money. 
we are simply going to rebuild Laodicea with our own. What does that tell you about them? They were very rich. They were rich. And when you're very rich and you depend on it, what does that make? What is that? What, what's one of the well, t- temptations? They spiritually poor. But they were, they were spiritually poor. You're right on. You're better off than a lot of these classes that we're doing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but what, what's the temptation of having so much money? You want more. You want more? Greed? What's another one? You trust in it. You trust in it. You become dependent on it. And you become proud of it. You become proud of it. And that is exactly what they told Rome. We don't need your money. Yes. We will rebuild it ourselves. Someone Yeah. <laughs> We rebuild it ourselves. But what, is it, what does Jesus say about it? Jesus talks about this. He says, you're rich and you have need of nothing. You think you're rich. Mm-hmm. I, got, I, yeah. got a, I got a scripture. To pick yeah, up. go ahead, brother. It's um, Mark 10, 25, 27. It says, it is easier for a camel to go through yeah. an eye of needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. There's no dependence on God. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And the influence of the city was due to its affluence. This, the influence of the city was due to its affluence, meaning that they felt influential. What's affluence? Uh, money. Oh. Because of their, their, their prosperity. Because of their prosperity. So their influence was affected by their prosperity. Because they were pro- uh, prospered, because they, were, they had a lot of prosperity, pride and self-sufficiency set in. Yes. You don't need anybody. You know? Uh, what does that sound like to you? I mean, isn't that a little bit more sound like Western culture thinking, right? We are the richest countries in the world, are the Western countries, right? If the, the Western-speaking English democracies are the most affluent countries in the world. You know, England, the UK, right? Um, we got the United States, we got Canada, we got Australia, we got... South Africa, we got uh, New Zealand, right? Um, yes, I mean, and overall, um, overall, the European Union, of course, has taken over that. But the uh, it, but they have to unite in order to make their affluence, right? Because you have you have poor countries too within Europe. But the, the the Western ones, the English ones, are the most affluent ones, no doubt about it. Per capita, uh, they make up a lot of the seven G, the nation seven G, and the twenty G nations, right? So. Uh, the sufficiency, the self-sufficiency in their pride, right? You know, we are Americans. We're going to get by. We don't, you know, we don't get donations. We give donations, right? Mm-hmm. The world depends on us. We're the policemen of the world, that type of thinking, right? And uh, I want you to be aware of that. Nonetheless, it's true. This is what America says in terms of our government says. Not every American thinks like that. But I'm saying that's the culture. That's the mentality. And that what could come into our Christian thinking and Christian living and say, well, I must be blessed because I'm in America. I must be blessed because I go to church in the Western countries of the world. Look at us. We have designer jeans, designer boots, designer churches, designer... Yeah. Right? <laughs> we must be blessed by God. Aren't we? we must be doing something right. And we can fall into the same trap the same way. Now, it's interesting, in the book of Colossians, in the book of Colossians, and you can read it on your own later, in the last chapter of that letter, Paul speaks of a man named Epaphras. Epaphras. And Epaphras was a man who really loved the churches. This is uh, one of the unsung heroes of the Bible. I guess we, we talk a lot about disciples in, in, in true, that's, that's right. But there's a lot of other men and women that are not mentioned much in the Bible, but they're all, they carried out great exploits for the Lord. And Epaphras was a man who risked his life, Paul says, and he went to Colossa, and he went to Colossae, and he went to Laodicea. He had a heart for Laodicea, it says. He had a heart for the Colossians. He risked his life. And he says, he spoke of Epaphras that the true riches, the true riches uh, of belonging to Jesus, the true riches of belonging to Jesus and the danger of the deception of the wisdom of the world. It says, don't not be taken in by man's philosophies and wisdom that's according to man. Who brought that message to Laodicea? It was Epaphras. Epaphras took what Paul wrote in Colossians. He had a heart for them, and he took the letter, took it to Colossae, or Colossians, 
and he took it to Laodicea. He says, beware of man's wisdom and philosophy. Don't get cut up. The true riches belong to Jesus. And true riches are those who belong, uh, who belong to Jesus, have the true riches, because Jesus is our greatest treasure, right? All the, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ Jesus only. And he says, beware of vain philosophies. He even said, beware of those who take a stand on visions of angels. You know, people that take stand on visions and all kinds of uh, uh, superstition, according to the elementary principles of this world. Uh, beware of those who take uh, a form of religion, but it's actually false humility. It's not really true, because they tell you, don't touch this, don't touch that, I don't need this, I don't need that, right? And uh, all those things, religion, philosophy, men's ideas, are part of what Paul warned the Colossians, and by virtue of Epaphras, he warned the Laodiceans. Now it seems like that letter must have had an effect on, Colo on the Colossians more than it had on Laodicea. Because we read 30 years later, just about, Jesus writes a letter to Laodicea, not Colossians, and tells them where they've gone off wrong. And boy, did they get off wrong. So uh, let's read verse 1, please, again. I'm sorry, verse 14, the first verse about Laodicea. To the church, to the angel of the church of Laodicea, write the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, Jesus introduces himself very much related to chapter 1. If you remember chapter 1, uh, there is a, a rebuke and a correction when that happens, right? And Jesus says here that he is the true faithful witness, that he is the amen, the amen. Now, what does that mean, the amen? Let it be so. Let it be so, okay. Uh, it is a Hebrew word, the Hebrew word. It is transliterated, not translated. It's one of those few, few <laughs> words in the Bible that are not translated. It's transliterated. What it means is, what it means is that it's, it's Hebrew, but we say it in an English way. We don't translate it. We say it the way the... We repeat the same thing that Hebrews say, but we say it in an English way. Amen. It's, an, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a Hebrew word. Yes. Uh, Mar Anatha. Maranatha. It's, 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 it's an Aramaic you know, version of, of the Hebrew. Uh, it talks about the Lord coming. Right? Come Lord Jesus. Right? Come quickly Lord. Um, uh, those are Hebrew words that are transliterated into English. But Amen. If you were to translate it, it means let it be so. Or I agree. Amen. Or we can say verily, verily. Yes. Truly, truly. Yes. Right? Those are all things that Jesus said, right? Amen and amen. Some translations in the Bible say amen and amen. Right? I tell you this. Or they say truly, truly. Or verily, verily. And we go, well, why does he have to say that? Because he's making an emphatic form of this is absolutely true. And Jesus is describing himself as an amen here. Turn to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, verse 16. Somebody read that, please. Isaiah 65, 16. He who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. Twice in that verse, God says he is the God of truth. The God of truth. Literally, the God of amen. Amen. Truly, truly. The God of amen. The God of truth. This is what Jesus says in the Gospels, right? Amen and amen. Verily, verily. It's the ultimate confirmation of what is being said. So when Art said, let it be so, that's exactly what that word means. So when we say amen, brother, he says, let it be so. Truly, truly. This is exactly right. It has the full weight of God's authority in that statement. When we say amen, it has the full weight of God's authority in that sentence. So whatever was said that is true, if it's according to God's and according to his truth, because he's the God of truth. Remember, Jesus is also, he is yeah, the yeah. truth, right? He's the truth. And we have the Holy Spirit of truth in 1 John, right? The Holy Spirit of truth. He is ultimately the God of 
of truth. There's no lie in him. There's no lies. There's no hypocrisy. There's no shadow of turning with God. He is the God of Amen. Tina, you got that one? Second Corinthians one twenty. Yes. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Amen. For all the promises of God, as many as they are, they are yes and amen according to Jesus. He is the amen of God. That means that whatever God has said, it is accomplished in Jesus. All the promises of God funnel into one person, Jesus the Messiah, right? That's how powerful Jesus is. Think of all the promises of God. About three and a half inches right here. All the promises of God. So be it. That's another way of saying it, right? All the promises of God are guaranteed in Christ Jesus. He is the guarantor of the promises of God to you. He's the guarantee that he is who he claims to be by God raising him from the dead. Remember it says in Romans, he became the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. He's always been the son of God. Don't get me wrong. But why does Paul say he became the son of God? It was the ultimate proof that he was. It was the ultimate proof that he was the son of God. If Jesus, and I've said this before, and I mean no sacrilegious meaning by it or any, any, uh, anything by it, no disrespect, but if Jesus would have just died on the cross, he would have just been another dead Jew, like many there were during that time. But if he rose from the dead, he is the Son of God. Yes, absolutely. The death of Jesus accomplishes nothing unless there's a resurrection. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Unless there's a resurrection, the cross means nothing. But because there's a resurrection, the cross means everything. And the empty tomb means everything, right? And then all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. That's the guarantor of all the promises of God. God raised him from the dead. So when I pray and I say amen, we're putting that prayer under the authority of Jesus. Amen. So we've got to be careful how we pray, right? Yeah. <laughs> we've got to be careful how we pray, not foolishly, That's right. not frivolously, yeah. not selfishly. Right? As James warns us about, there's all the things God warns us about. Be careful how we pray. It's not just saying amen, I got my seal of approval. God's bound to do it now. You know, like the word of faith preachers teach, you know, that Let your God's bound to few. do it. What's that? Let your words be few. Yeah. To a large degree, you can say, Lord, this prayer, I'm humbly submitting to you. <laughs> I'm submitting it to Jesus because he's the guarantor of all the promises. Now, he's also called the faithful witness. Amen. The faithful witness. Turn to Revelation 1.5. Somebody can read that, please. Revelation 1.5. A few chapters before Revelation 1 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. He is the faithful witness. Now, the word faithful, and we can translate it in our English vernacular, 21st century English, we can say the word reliable. He is the reliable one. Jesus is the reliable, true and faithful witness of God. How did he demonstrate that reliability? He would have said he was going to do it. And what, what did he say he was going to do? God. God. That's right. He put his life on the line and raised himself from the dead. Now, obviously, he raised himself from the dead. He says he would do it. The Father did it. The Holy Spirit did it. They all worked in unison in one to raise the body of Jesus from the dead. He bore the truth. In other words of saying it, he bore the truth and he died for the truth. Remember when he stood before Pilate? He stood before Pilate and what was Pilate's cynical remark? What is truth? What is truth? What is truth? That's typical Roman thinking, right? Romans believe in many deities, many pagan gods. It was all relative to him. He was the ultimate relative, the relativistic philosopher. What is truth? Right? Out of all his years as a, uh, as a governor, as all his years as a, uh, in political, he realized there's no truth. <laughs> Everybody does whatever they want. What is truth? But Jesus says he came to bear witness of the truth. Amen. There's one truth. And he thought he had all the power, right? Pilate said, don't you know I have the authority to release you? Jesus says, no, you don't. You don't have any power, right, Joel? Yeah, right. you got none. The only thing you have is what my father gave you. The only true, reliable, the only truth is that there's one God. That's the truth. 
That's the reality. By the way, the word truth, we can translate it reality. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word truth can be easily translated as reality. What is the reality? Well, what is the reality of the universe? Are there many gods, like most people in the world believe? No. No. Are there some gods? No. No. Not the way the people describe them, right? We know that these false gods are demons, right? There is a devil, absolutely. But the, re- the ultimate truth of the universe is that there's one God. And he has a son. And he's revealed himself in the flesh. And he died, rose again, ascended on, and ascended on high, and left us his spirit to dwell with us and comfort us until his return. That's the ultimate truth. And that's the ultimate truth that Pilate could not receive. He was standing in front of the truth. And he could not receive it. And therefore, we have no record of Pilate ever um, a record of Pilate ever repenting or ever coming to Christ. And so he is the faithful one. He's the one that reveal in fullness who God really is, right? What did Philip ask Jesus? Jesus, show us the Father. What does Jesus say? Oh, he's right here. He's a picture. Yeah, by the way. No? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You got it, right? He is the ex- ex- the representation, the exact representation of the Father. Somebody turn to Hebrews 1 3. Hebrews 1 3. You want to read this, Reedy? Go for it. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact res- representation of His being, sustained all things by His powerful word after He had provided. Did pur- purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the ma- majesty in heaven. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hold on to those words. He is the exact image of God. He is the one who demonstrated the character of God. Why, what did Jesus say? If you see me, you've seen the Father. Amen. You want to know the Father? Know me. You cannot know God unless you know Jesus. And by the way, you can't be a Christian unless you believe in Jesus. Some people think you can be a Christian and just believe in God. The Bible says no. You can't be a Christian and just believe in God. You have to be a Christian. You have to believe in Jesus in order to be a Christian. That's how much authority Jesus has. But he is the representation of the Father. He is the exact image, meaning that if you've seen Jesus, his character, his love, his kindness, his mercy, but also his judgment and his truth, then you've seen how the Father is. You've seen how the Father is. And that's why, remember, in the high priestly prayer of Jesus, John 13 through 17, he's always pointing to the Father. He's always he's talking to the Father and pointing to the Father, and then telling his disciples that they need to know the Father because the Father loves you, right? As I have loved you. And all these wonderful things and truth about the Father are all fulfilled in Jesus. Remember, in Christ dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Right? Everything that there is to know about God, all you have to do is study Jesus. Yes. And you'll see. You'll see how God is. And uh, in an even more greater way, because there's another side of Jesus, right? His humanity. Yes. The humanity of Jesus. When he cried, when he wept, when he, was, when he missed his friends, when he was lonely, when he was fearful. Right? The humanity of Christ represented very much in the Bible. So he's also the beginning in the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. Now Jehovah's Witness have this verse highlighted and they'll show up to your door and say, ha, 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 see? It says Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. That means that he was created, they say. Within his humanity. What's that? Oh, I just said within his humanity. Yeah, for sure, for sure, his body. Yeah, for sure, his body. Uh, but that it's it's if you have a if you have a study Bible, it'll tell you. you have a little footnote on that word, and it'll give you a footnote, and it'll tell you that beginning is a uh, good translation, but uh, you can go deeper in that. And it's the word we get architect from. It's the oh, yeah. word that we get architect from. Now, what does an architect do? He designs. Yeah, you can literally read it. He is the designer of the creation of God. He is the builder of the creation of God. Who created everything? Jesus. Turn to John 1. Turn to John 1. Yeah, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
The same was in the beginning with God. All things are made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Yeah. Amen. Everything that was made was because of Jesus. Nothing that was made, um, apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He is the one who made everything. Colossians 1.17 says the same thing. He is the creator. He is the creator. He is actually active in creation. Uh, above all things, he is the one who created it all. And in a very simple way, you can say, the Father designed it. The Son created it by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how creation began. That's how everything was made. God had a plan. Jesus executed the plan by the power of the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.17. Susie, you want to tackle that one? Colossians 1.17. Oh, sorry, 16 and 17. Sorry, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He Amen. is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen. Amen. So all things, all things were made through him, and by him and for him, including you. Now put yourself in that sentence. You were created through him and by him and for him. That means if you don't become a Christian, you would never fulfill what you were created for, for Jesus. You were created for his glory. You were made, on, you were made into the image and likeness of our creator. For his own special pleasure, for his own special pleasure, he wanted to create a family. He wanted to create his own family. Don't you want a family? Don't you have a family? Well, God has a big family, and he wanted you to be a part of it. You didn't know. I ran away from him for 20-some years. I didn't know. But when I came to Jesus, I came home. I finally came home. That was the reality of it. Amen. And that's what I told people today, you know, that that's the reason why God created them, so they could be part of his family. Now, they may not understand it, they might not know it yet, they might not realize it yet, by God's grace they will, but that's truly of all of us. We were created for the glory of Jesus, for all things were created for his glory. It says Revelation 4 and 5, we're going to read it next time we meet, Revelation 4 and 5, that things were created by the Father, and there's praise in heaven because he created all things. For himself, right? Uh, but here in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Colossians, it says that it was Jesus. The agent of creation was Jesus. That's what that means. The beginner, the architect, the designer of all of God's creation is Jesus the Messiah. Lucy, you have a question? Okay, I thought you raised your hand. Sorry. No problem. So that's what that means. That's what verse 15 means. Uh, sorry, 14. Which did you get, uh, John, what was it? John, John 1, John 1 through 3. Okay. In Colossians, no problem. No problem. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17. All right. But well, what else does it say? Now we get to, so Jesus introduces himself. We got part of the introduction. Sorry, it took a while. Verse 15. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Nothing good to say. Nothing good to say. Now, like I told you earlier about cold drinks, a cold glass of water is good and refreshing, especially after a hot day at work. You're out there, you're sweating, somebody hands you a nice bottle of water, refreshing. You go, you're cold, you need, some, uh, uh, you need some warmth, nothing better than a hot cup of tea, right, Miss uh, Yolanda? Right? Nice cup of tea, so good. It's so refreshing, I guess you could say in a different way. They're useful. Hot drinks, hot water is useful, cold water is useful. Yes, it is. Mix it, no good. Especially in that water. Especially that water, that minerals, those minerals at a warm temperature can make you very sick. That was the, that was the, the background of Colossus. The, the minerals in that water from Pamukula, from Hierapolis, will make you sick if they're lukewarm. Yes. Now, our lives are to be useful for God. He made us to be useful for His... Remember, for him, or by him, through him, and for him. 
We were made to glorify God. Our lives, now as Christians, now as Christians we can glorify God uh, the ultimate because we now belong to Him. We, we, every, any person is the image of God. Right? Any person is created in the image of God. All humans are. There's the dignity of humanity created in the image of God. But the believers bear more of the glory of God because now we have come back to our Creator. We have His Spirit in us. We've been reborn. We have a new, we know, new relationship with God and through, the, through the new birth. That is what God created us for, to be useful. We are to be useful. Just like the cold water, just like the hot water, it's useful. What, is he, what, is, uh, what are we useful for? What does God wants us to do? Nathan, ambassadors. ambassadors for him. What else? Testify. Testify. What else? Serve. Serve, yeah. Mm-hmm. Glorify him in this world, right? By living a, a godly life and a character that exemplifies God, right? Those things are there. Evidence of our good works, it even says in Matthew. Uh, good works that will glorify God and will glorify the Father in heaven. We're to do that. We're to magnify God in that way. Different forms and different ways, right? Not everybody's a cold water. Not everybody's a cup of tea. I'm not everybody's cup of tea, by the way. Some people really don't like me. That's just the reality. That's just the reality. Yeah. I'm not even her cup of tea sometimes, you know. Uh, uh, but we all are used by the Lord, right? Amen. As long as we're committed to the Lord, we are useful. Was Peter the same as John? No. 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 Was John the same as Paul? No. Was James the same as, as John? No. no. They were all different, different temperaments, different things. They did different things. One was a cup of cold water. The other was a warm cup of coffee. Or, you know, but they were useful. They were needed. They were effective in how they were created. They were made in how their character was. God used them. However, if they became indifferent, if they became indifferent to the work of God, and if they were not committed to the work of the Lord, it didn't matter how hot you were or how cold you were, you are now falling into lukewarmness. No use at all. Just like the salt, right? Jesus said, we're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, it is not good but to be trampled under the foot of men, right? Same thing with the hot water. Same thing with the water. Hot water, great. Cold water, great. Mix the two, no. What does that tell you about mixture? It's not the best. It's not the best. God hates the mixture. God hates the mixture. Now, this word here, I wish. It says, I wish. My translation says, I wish, I think. I would, sorry, I would. Or I wish that you were cold or hot. Look it up on your own when you get home. The word I wish or I would, uh, it's a very sad word because it means, yes, God wants it to happen, but it's very unlikely that this would happen. That's what that word means. It means that there's a desire, but it's not going to come to pass. A wish that is not going to happen. Jesus is saying, I would that you would be cold or hot, but I don't think it's going to happen. This way I have to tell you, though, I have to throw you out of my mouth. God has to shock them into reality. Remember, he's the God of truth. What do they need the most right now, the Laodicean church? They need the truth. They don't need Joel Olstein to pat them on the back and tell them that they're okay and God loves them and they're good, right? They don't need that. They need somebody to tell them the truth and no one else is reliable than Jesus. He is the ultimate truth. And he's going to tell them, I wish you could change. I wish you were hot or cold. But I don't think that's going to happen. And the Lord knows. And he used that word. The Holy Spirit put that word in there. I would, I would that you were cold or hot, but I know it's not going to happen. When we are not useful to the Lord, when we're not useful to the Lord, that's when we fall into lukewarmness. Lukewarmness. God is pleased with us, and therefore he'll use us. All right? We're active in Him. We're serving Him. As Lucy said, we were created. We were saved to serve. We were saved to a ministry. We're, but, you know, we're struggling and fighting and contending for the faith. That's normal, right? That's what happens. That's, that's being hot or cold. Contending for the faith. There's struggles. There's difficulties. But we're contending, right? We're growing. There's challenges, right? Like I told you, if we were attacked, you would be on your guard. 
If you were being persecuted, you would be on your guard. You would go, hey, you know, I'm, they're persecuting me for my faith. I need to be on point with the Lord against my enemies. But when there's no persecution, you lull to sleep. I must be okay. There's nothing wrong. Look, I'm at peace. I'm at ease. And yet we can be falling right into that temptation. Yeah, the temptation is to be indifferent. Not to be hot or cold, but to be indifferent, to be lukewarm. I know I should be serving the Lord, but uh, I don't know. It's so hard. I know I should be praying for people, but, you know, I got so much to do. I'm busy. You know, I know I should be a Bible study. No offense to anybody didn't come. You know, I know I should be a Bible study, but, uh, you know, I just got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of things in my life. I got, I got work. I got to, who's going to pay the bills? You know, who's going to do this? Who's gonna... And we can come up with all kinds of excuses, right, to the reality that, our love is waning. Our commitment is waning. Our dedication is waning. I'm not saying you miss one time. Or something. That's, of course, everybody knows that, right? We're not talking about regiment and, you know, make sure everybody's got their scorecard and you punch them in and you punch them out. But we're talking about a level of character and your commitment level that is waning, that is not being used of the Lord, that is indifferent. But you can, look, you can love the Lord you can hate the Lord. At least there's emotions. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. Not wanting anything to do with it. You know what I'm saying? Yes. At least there's emotion. At least you love God and you're passionate about it. Well, if you hate God, at least you're passionate about it. You still believe in Him. <laughs> you know, you, you hate Him, but you still believe that He's there. Yes. Someone who's indifferent doesn't care about God, doesn't live like He doesn't exist. That's worse. And that That's is dangerous. what Jesus is talking about here. The indifference. Mm-hmm. You're so indifferent about me. Mm-hmm. There wouldn't be any, any difference between a believer and an unbeliever if the believer fell into lukewarmness. Maybe the unbeliever at least doesn't like God, at least believes that he is exist, he's existing and he doesn't like him. But the believer who falls into lukewarmness just, just lives like he doesn't really matter. Lives like he doesn't really matter. Oh, I know I should be, but, you know, I don't know. I don't want to get involved in people's lives. If I go to the man's study, I have to pray for people, talk to people. <laughs> they get to know me. I get to know them. They're messy. That guy's messed up. I don't want to pray for him. <laughs> then if he likes me, he wants me to call him tomorrow. And I don't want to do that, you know? You know? I'm not talking about anybody's... <laughs> yeah. Right? He's going to text me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was just right? Yeah. You know, people... Yeah, people are messy, man. They're sticky. You know, I mean, people's got problems. People got problems. And I, I got my own problems. I don't want to get involved in other problems. And if I find out, then I'm accountable now. I don't want to know, right? And, you know, we laugh about it. That's how people think. People don't want to commit to ministry. They want to commit to serving, you know, because of that very reason. It's too messy. It's too sticky. People are messed up. And I, you know, I don't want to, you know... <laughs> Then they're going to call me and call you and ask for prayer. And, and uh, you know, i got my own life to live, you know. Got things to do, right? And people become self-focused, self-reliance, yes. and not call. And these are Christians, by the way. These are, you know, calling themselves believers. And they're saying, I just don't want to serve. I just don't want to get involved. I, I want to be indifferent. Why? There's, there's, there's it's safety there, right? It's not hot or cold. You're not being used. Just yeah, somebody said blend in. Yeah. yeah, you just blend into the to the thing. Hey, I, I got my own busy life. You know, I got to keep up with this lifestyle. I got to keep up with the Kardashians type of lifestyle. And, <laughs> and that's, that's the Western culture, right? That's you know, that's the Western mentality. You know, it, it gets in the way of my Instagram chats and things like that, right? People call for prayer. I, I can't watch my videos or you know whatever people, what else people do. But I'm, I'm being facetious, of course. But God is pleased. With we, when we are hot or cold. Mm-hmm. At least we're contending. It might not be easy, yeah. but we're contending for the faith. Yeah. And God is pleased with us, right? But not contending for the faith, not being part of the body, not meeting the needs of the body. The body is always needy, by the way. Amen. You might think people are messed up, but we're all, we're all messed up. Amen. That's what the church is, a hospital for broken people, not a museum for holy saints, right? It's a hospital for broken people. What do broken people need? Yeah, the Holy Spirit, they need help in the form of people, right? In the form of people. And, uh, and God uses us in that way. 
It's always, you know, like Charles Spurgeon said, there's never a day when a Christian has, can say, there's nothing to do. Because there's always sheep that wander off. They wander off the, 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 the pasture. There's always sheep that haven't come back. There's always marriages that struggle. There's always people that need help. There's always somebody that needs encouragement. Always, always, always. That's what we go into church. When you go to the church building, right? You meet the church. You go in the building, you meet the church. Expect to be used by the Lord. Expect to be used by the Lord. Why? There's always a need. It's always going to be a need. You may not find it right away. It may actually take an opportunity to ask somebody, how are you? <laughs> and hopefully they'll give you platitudes, but just say, you know, how are you doing? And you can pray for them, and you can relate to them, and you can minister to them, uh, and you can encourage them. Maybe somebody's in need of physical help. Maybe they're moving or something. Hey, maybe somebody's in need of financial help. Yes. And then God has, uh, has given us some resources that we can, we can do that, right? So God, that, always look to the Lord to, to use you. Not just with the church body in the building, right, in that particular building, but as you go. As you go. God, we met the need of some believers today. We met the need of other unbelievers today, but God used us and God Amen. used you guys in a, in a wonderful way. The mixture. God hates the mixture. God hates the mixture. Turn to Leviticus 18. Turn to Leviticus 18. 24 to 28. I'll leave you on your own to read Leviticus 18. It's a great chapter to remember. Uh, Leviticus 18 has a lot of, a lot of things that will be probably banned from, uh, from public speaking. Public speech is soon. It's the way of Canada. Yes. It will be considered hate speech. The way Canada has gone, the way other countries have gone. Uh, Leviticus 18, verse 24 to 28, please. 24 to 28. After telling them all the things that they are not to do in the land, God says, these are abhorrences, these are abominations. God tells them why. Leviticus 18, 24 through 28. Ms. Dana? Uh, do not defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all of these, the nations which I'm casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled. Therefore, I have visited its punishment upon it. So the land has spewed out its inhabitants. But as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. For the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations and the land has become defiled. Mm. So that the land may not spew you out should you defile it as it has spewed out the nations which has been before you. The 28, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the land of Israel, the current people living there were the Amorites, the Canaanites, right? They were living there. And God says, well, they, they did all these terrible things. They polluted the land. Remember, God says, it's my land. They polluted the land, and what did the land do? They vomited out. Same idea here, same expression. Vomited out because they were so abhorrent to God. And he said, well, that's them. But then he says, but if you behave the same way, if you mix your faith in me with the practices of the Canaanites, yeah. what is the land going to do to you, Israel? It's going to vomit you out. It says it twice, right? Vomit you out. It's going to vomit you out. The land's going to do the same thing. And it did. <laughs> it did. It did it at the time of the Babylonians. It did it at the time of the Romans. God made sure that if his people went astray, the land will not be able to hold uh, the people there. It will regurgitate. It will vomit them out. And it did it twice. Because they, they wouldn't do it. First idolatry and immorality. Then it was the rejection of the Messiah and the terrible sins that they were doing in the New Testament, right? Keeping people from their own Messiah. The land spewed them out. God gives us grace, right, for us. But our sin is no less grievous to Him, right? He gives us grace, but my sin is no less grievous to God than the, than the unbeliever down the street, right? If he sins and it's grievous to God, don't think my sin is any, any lesser than that. It's just the same, even less excuse for me because I know the truth <laughs> and I have the spirit to tell me not to do it, yeah. right? And so God gives us grace and Laodicea, your present condition, Laodicea, is as bad as the Canaanites. 
For the land to spew you out is one thing. For the Lord to spew you out, that's another thing. You're just bad as the Canaanites. So what did they do? What actually did they do to connect all of this? Well, let's turn to a couple books in the Bible here. Let's turn to 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17, 33. 2 Kings 17, 33. Remember, the Lord hates the mixture. The Lord hates the mixture. Now, in the Torah, you want to read it? Okay, hold it, hold that thought. In the Torah, in the Old Testament, in the five books of Moses, we are told, don't wear mixed materials. Don't wear a shirt of uh, flax and wool. All right? Don't plow the field with an ox and a donkey. Right? Don't mix the seeds on the ground. Now, is just God, does God have a thing about fashion? Don't wear, uh, you know, clothing of mixed material. Does God have a thing about, uh, uh, you know, sowing the land with a donkey and, a, and an ox? You know, does he not like animals like that? Does he not like seed being mixed together? I mean, uh, is there something more to this than just some of this funny, you would say funny rules, funny laws in the... Well, God is teaching them something. Don't mix. Don't mix. God hates the mixture. God wants purity. And by teaching the Jewish people early on about keeping things pure. Now, in the New Testament, don't worry about that law. Don't worry about mixed material. We all broken the law of Moses today because we're all wearing <laughs> we're all wearing clothing of mixed material. Sorry about that. But that's not in the New Testament. So it's, it was for the Jewish people at the time. It was the, the law, right? But God was teaching them something. The teaching was God hates the mixture because it was something that they needed to learn at a basic level so they could apply it at a spiritual level. 2 Kings 17.33. 2 Kings 17.33. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from there. So they feared the Lord and they served other gods? No yeah, Exactly. <laughs> they mixed it. Did you realize when the, they were worshiping Baal, when the, yeah. the Jews were worshiping Baal, because the name Baal means husband, master, or owner, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's yeah. what that means. Yeah. And God said to Israel, I am your Baal, I'm your husband, master, or owner, or Lord, right? That they thought they were worshiping Yahweh by worshiping Baal. Oh. <laughs> they thought, hey, we're worshiping Baal. We're worshiping our husband, master, or owner. But that's Baal. That's the Canaanite deity. That's the God of the harvest. That's the God of the rain. That's the God of thunder, right? That's the Canaanite deity, God, uh, uh, Baal, little g, right? The Jews thought they were worshiping, in the name of Yahweh, they were worshiping this God. They actually worshiped God in the high places, in the, in the, in the, up in the hills, up in the trees, in the groves. They were actually committing immorality and idolatry, but they were calling on the name of Yahweh. Now, how does that, does that scratch your head a little bit? Yes, yeah. How can you go out there and worship Yahweh, but do all these paganistic rituals and still think it's God? It's impossible. It is impossible. Because well, two yeah. Well, if you've ever been to like an Eastern Orthodox uh, service or a Catholic Mass <laughs> with statues and idols yep. and paganistic, cannibalistic rituals, and they still call it God, they still call it Jesus, they still say this is the saint of this, the saint of that. Well, it's exactly the same thing how the Jews got, in, got the problem. They called it God, they called it Jesus, but they were, they were other gods. There were a paganistic rituals in the name of, the name of Jesus, in the name of God. It's kind of like, uh, you know, it's Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic Jews, the Kabbalah. Right? They call it God, they call it the Shekinah glory, they call it the Holy Spirit, but... It's, it's all superstition. It's all occult practices. But yet they say it's God. They said all these things about God in the, in the Kabbalah, but it's, it's, it's totally occult. How do they do that? It's a mixture. They mix the two. They synchro... They, 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 uh, it's, it's a synchro... Uh, syncretism. Syncretism, thank you. It's a syncretism, and they come out with another religion or, or some sort of... That has the appearance of the old religion, but it's a whole new way of doing it, right? 
Uh, let's do another verse. 2 Kings 10, 28 and 29. 2 Kings 10, 28 and 29. They called on Baal, but they, they thought they were calling on the Lord. They called on Yahweh, <laughs> but they were worshiping up in, the, up in the hills. Now, where did God say to worship Him? What's the one place that they were to... Oh, 2 Kings 10, 28 and 29. Okay. 28 and 29. Now, where did God say to worship him? In the Old Testament, where did God say to worship him? In only one hill. What was that one hill? Mount Zion. Mount Zion. So if you went to any other hill and called on Yahweh, right, in a paganistic way, was that worshiping Yahweh? Not at all, by far. But they thought because they went to another hill <laughs> that they went to and they were calling on Yahweh that they were going to... Worship the Lord that way? Absolutely not. Uh, 2 Kings 10, 28, 29. Somebody got that? Thus Jacob destroyed Baal out of Israel, howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed from departed not from after them, to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. Mm. Jehu got rid of Baal, got rid of the, the foreign gods. But they didn't really truly get rid of them all. Mm -hmm. And even Jehu fell into that, that trap. Yep, he kept the two golden calves. Yes, right. Very good. One in, one in Dan, mm -hmm. one, one in Dan, and one in Beersheba, right? Uh, so they didn't have to go to Jerusalem. So if you live way up in the north in Israel, way up by the Golden Heights, you just went to Dan. Tell Dan. You see the archaeological evidence today. Just look it up online. Don't believe me. Look it up online. They have the... the, the the temple area, the the the, 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 the place where they worship them, the altar where they worship them, uh, they were worshiping the golden calf right there. They know exactly where it was, the, the Tel Dan. Uh, you go to Beersheba, near Samaria, just north of Judah, same thing, that's where they had the golden calf again. So if you live up in the north, you don't have to go to Jerusalem, just go to your local place. Just look to go to your ball shop, right? If you're in, the, in Samaria, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. Down the street, you find your uh, find your altar there. They thought they even said, "Remember in the in the golden calf uh, narrative, they even said this is the God who delivered you out of Egypt." They were calling on the golden calf. Yeah, and it happened to be on the day he was marrying them. It was in Mount Sinai with the Holy Spirit over them, the cloud over them, and God was saying, "I will do this for you. I'm going to take care of you. I will be your God. You will be my people. I'm going to protect you." That's what a husband would say, right? Is that what you said, right? Husbands, that's what you said you would do, right? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and then all, all of God's people had to say, yes, and we will follow the Lord. But God says, get down there, Moses. They're already messing with the golden calf. Get down there now, quick. And it was Aaron. Aaron did it. His own brother. His own brother. His own brother. Now, what was the punishment for idolatry? Yeah, Foreign gods, Yeah. What happened to Aaron? He didn't get death. What did he get? Um, he became the high priest. Why? Was yeah. his idea? Grace, my friend. Grace, Grace, even the worst of us. Although he did get, he had his death earlier. Yeah, he eventually died. Yeah, that yeah. is true. But God made him the high priest. Yeah. Isn't that Grace? Mm -hmm. Isn't that awesome? We've done some grievous things, okay. terrible things. Might not done that, but maybe other things. And God still made you his son. God still made you his daughter. Made you an heir with Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing grace. Uh, we read that already? Yeah. Uh, one more. Zephaniah 1.5. Sayla, you want to get that one? Yeah. All right. Zephaniah 1.5, sweetie. You got it? Those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Moloch. Yeah. Now what are you doing there? Swearing by the Lord and swearing by Moloch. It's a mixture. Mm -hmm. They just because they had the temple and they had the Lord, they had the name of the Lord, they said. Mm -hmm. That was enough. They can do whatever they wanted after that. Because we know God. We know God. You know, we know God, therefore we can do whatever we want. We can even worship Moloch. They swear by Moloch, and they swore by the Lord. They were just 
calling God whatever they wanted. They were using God to their own vain imagination. They were using God. And Molech was the God that they offered their children to. Remember in the Second Kings? God. That's right. That's right. So God hates the mixture. They mixed everything together. The syncretism was horrible in Israel, horrible in Judah. God had to say enough is enough. They were spewed out of the land. By the way, lukewarmness is that mixture that uh, Laodicea is talking about here, right? You're no use. You're, no, you're not of you, any use. You're not useful. And I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. The word vomit the word vomit in the Greek, emeo, emeo, it literally means to be repulsed, to show utter rejection, to reject with extreme disgust. This is what Jesus said about this church, his church, right? It's not just the Old Testament and when God, you know, vomited the people out of the land, but it's the New Testament too, his people, where he says that their complacency was nauseating. Their mix of their culture in the worldly ways in the world was so nauseating to the Lord mm -hmm. that he literally was tired of their complacency and he needed to bring them back to reality. Just shock them to the re to realities, right? I wish the people of Israel were not mixed with paganistic stuff, the Lord said. I wish they weren't. But these people see nothing wrong with it and therefore they need to be vomited out. When it goes so far that they don't recognize the difference between Molech and the Lord, there's no cure for that except to be vomited out. When people go so far, when Israel went so far, when they started mixing Molech, Baal, worship, the stars, the mountains, the groves, God said, enough is enough. Here comes Babylon. Here comes Assyria. Eventually, here comes Rome. Right? Roman came. And uh, what's the current state of the church? What's the current state of the church? Churches are very happy today if Christians have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Very happy, very complacent. You know, they don't mind worldly Christians. James says in James, in the, I think it's the third chapter of James, about you worldly churches, you know, the warning to the worldly churches. Yes. You adulterers, he says you worldly, friendship with the world. They have this friendship with the world. And the world, please, by no means do I mean the earth or anything yeah. like that. It's the system. Yeah. It's the philosophy of the world. What does the world think about love? What does God think about love? What does the world think about marriage? What does the Lord think about marriage? What does the world think about children? What does the Lord think about children? What does the Lord think about truth? What does the world think about truth, right? It all comes down to the reality. What is reality? What is truth? What is the Lord? And what does he say about it? And what does the world say? And very much... Churches think like the world today. Well, liberal Protestantism has gone off a long time, but the World Council of Churches, this is past week, the WCC, based in Jerusalem, they have all their processions, and else that looks crazy. But anyways, just they're, you know, this is liberal Protestantism, but looks more like a combination of Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholicism, Russian Orthodox, and, and Protestantism all mixed in together, you know, parading in Jerusalem. Um, in Jerusalem. And they came out and said, well, we're, we're anti-Israel. We're, we're against the Jews. We're, they, 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 the church is right there in Jerusalem. We're against the Jews. Jews are racist. Jews are this. They're the enemy. they oppressive. They said there's like apartheid. But the World Council of Churches will never, ever, ever say anything about Islam persecuting Christians. Yes. Will never say anything about Jinping killing Christians. Uh, or killing the Uyghurs, the Muslim Uyghurs, right? They would never, not that I agree with Islam, but I don't agree with killing Uyghurs, uh, just like China's doing. They'll never come against African nations who persecute Christians. They'll never say anything against them, or Syria, or Iran, that persecutes pastors and Christians. They'll never say anything against them, but they will go after Israel. Mm -hmm. Very anti-Semitic. What is the world? Well, it's like the world. Go to the UN. They'll do exactly the same thing. The UN will do exactly the same thing. They will castigate Israel for persecuting Muslims, for attacking this, attacking that, but they will never stand up for any Christian or any nation that is persecuted by Muslims or Chinese troops or anything like that. They will never stand up for Taiwan or Hong Kong. Absolutely not. Yes. The World Council of Churches, 
It's just like the world. It just might as well be the world. Don't even call it a church anymore. Just call, call it a council of antichrist or something like that. That's really what they are. Yeah, but, they, but that's what they do, right? Well, the Vatican is the same thing. The Vatican claims to be you know, the vicar of Christ, and they don't stand up for the plight of Christians ever. They won't. In fact, when they were challenged about China, the Pope said, you know, Jinping's doing nothing wrong. We just signed a deal. And the Chi- even the Chinese Catholics were offended what the Pope did. Because yes. he basically yeah. sold them out. He sold them out. He didn't care about the persecution of even Chinese Catholics. They just... It might as well be the UN. Yeah. The ICC, the International Criminal Courts, did the same thing to Israel this week. They were trying Israel for war crimes. But they won't put, you know, uh, the, the Iranian... The, 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 the Hezbollah or the Mullahs or the Ayatollahs or Xi Jinping will never be put on criminal... They'll put Donald Trump on criminal courts... He defended Christians. He defended people that at least, uh, you know, at least for their faith. He said, don't do it. He put a stop to it. Now the Biden's president, ISIS, comes out of the woodworks now. 10,000 fighters in Syria ravaging the, uh, the Middle East, attacking Christians and even uh, poor Muslims, right? What's, there's no good. Absolutely no good. And now church is getting into racial theory, Right? Racial theory, yeah. Everything's racist. America's racist country. We shouldn't be living here, right? Uh, it's like an apartheid, you know, it's, it's, it's systemic racism. Everything's bad. Everything's awful. You know, reparations, uh, climate change. All, just go to the UN. It's exactly what the UN teaches. Exactly what Marxism teaches. What are these churches good for? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. One foot in church, one foot in the world. But you see by their preachers. Famous preacher, most popular preacher in, uh, in Asia, Joseph Prince. Most popular preacher in America, I mean, to whatever degree that is, Joel Osteen, right? What do they preach? You can have your best life now, and you can have your best life in heaven. Well, well how do you have your best life now? if you're going to have the best life later. (laughs) It's not your best life if you're going to have one better later. But if this is as best as it's going to get, this is as better as you're going to get, then there's no eternity. There's no eternal life. It's popular to think that this is what God wants. God wants to have your best life now. Now, God wants to bless our life. God wants to keep us, and God wants to encourage us, and he does give us a life of the Spirit, a life of peace that passes all understanding. Make no mistake about it. But it's not our best life now. This life is full of enemies. This life is full of trials and tribulations and difficulties and hardships. Through many toils, snares, right? Uh, It says the song, right? Through many toils, troubles and snares, right? We've gone through it. But there's more. In fact, Jesus says, you know, that we will have tribulation. We will have tribulation in this life. But not to be discouraged. He's overcome the world, right? Right? We live in a good and comfortable society. And the church has become good and comfortable in this world. There's no talk about eternal life much or the cross, right? It used to be a popular song in churches, right? The old rugged cross, right? Yeah. And I'll exchange it one day for a crown. That was the, that was, that was the hymn of believers, right? Yeah. That old rugged cross. I, I cherish the old rugged cross and one day I will exchange it one day for a crown. Now they just say, throw away the crown, throw away the cross, get your crown now. Get your crown now, because you're a king's kid, right? They want to have the best life here now, to get comfortable and then go to heaven. Well, everybody would want that, right? Have your best life now and go to heaven? Yeah, that's why they're so popular. But it only works in the Western world. It only works in the Western world. Go try to sell that to believers in Syria or China or Africa, being slaughtered in India, being chased, hunted down in Indonesia. How, how could you tell them this is your best life now? It's the best life like now. You're crazy, right? right? It, it, it's, it's, it's crazy to people. It doesn't work. It does not work. Children meeting in a home, you know, in a, in a slab, you know, a mud slab in a church because they have nothing else to, to meet and they're just clapping, singing to Jesus and saying, I'm going to go see Jesus soon. I'm going to go see Jesus soon. That's what they have. They have Jesus. We have everything else. And Laodicea had everything else and Jesus was outside. That's where the difference was. Now, what does Jesus think about this? Verse 16. 
I will vomit you out of my mouth. You are a mixture. You are a mixture. You've mixed faith with the world. You mix faith with the world and you've traded in. You've traded in the ease and the comfort of your life because you're rich. Look at verse 17. You say you're rich and it's so toxic to the body that Jesus has only one answer. Out of the body. Vomit it out. That's right. Is that amazing? That Jesus has to remove that toxin out of the body of Christ in order for the body to be good? I mean, I, I've read medical journals where you know things become so bad that there's toxins in you. They have to go in there and you know, either help the vomiting, help the diarrhea, help something. But you have to get it out. You have to get it out. Otherwise, it's going to poison the whole body. It's going to poison the whole body. And they have to give you antibody, uh, antibiotics and all kinds of stuff to, uh, to, to get you back up and running. Well, Jesus says, this is the attitude that I'm going to take. You're so toxic, I have to get you out. Yes. You're no good to the body anymore. You're actually harming the body of Christ. Joe Olstein is ar- harming the body of Christ. Yes, yeah. Joseph Prince is harming the body yeah. of Christ. These word faith money preachers are harming the body of Christ. They're a toxin. But what do people do? They put up with it and send them more money. Yeah. Instead of doing what Jesus said, don't put up with it, vomit about, they actually accept it. And they think this is Christianity. And so they view Christianity from the lens of a nice, comfortable Christian life. Mm-hmm. Now, by all means, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter how much people have. That never bothered me that Christians, some Christians have plenty, some Christians don't. Mm-hmm. I just say those who have plenty be generous and give and give to the Lord. Um, but when it becomes part of your faith, when you say, I am rich, therefore I'm a Christian, you know, or I'm, I'm, I'm rich because I am a Christian, then there's something wrong. We have swallowed that in because there's plenty of wonderful believers who have no pennies in their bank, either a sixpence to, to spend, but they're the most wonderful Christians you'll ever meet. They have wonderful prayers, they have wonderful worship, and this is the attitude. It's so bad it has to be rejected, but you have to see it with spiritual eyes. Verse 17. You say you're rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and you do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What is popular today is, you know, life, best life now, live a comfortable life, no commitment. No commitment. That kind of behavior, it's really a poison to the body of Christ. God did not make us to do that. God made us to serve. He saved us to a ministry. It says in Timothy, God who called us, right, before eternity, right, he called us and saved us from eternity. That means he called you to be saved and he called you um, and called you and saved you. He saved you from eternity and called you to your calling, to a ministry from eternity. He did it. From eternity, he's given you a ministry. Now, the wonderful news is to find out what that ministry is. The wonderful search yes. is to find out what the Lord has equipped you for and gifted yes. you for. We'll be talking about Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 tomorrow, the gifts of the Spirit. What's wonderful to know is what gifts did He give you? What gifts are for the body of Christ? No, not He gave them to you. He gave them through you, right? To the body, but through you. You're the vehicle. You're the vessel that God uses uh, for the body of Christ, for the encouragement of the body. That's the search that we need to find out. That's what we need to pray fast. And trust God that he's going to show us, what did you call me to do? You saved me. You called me. What did you want me to do? Lord, here I am. Send me. Right? Or Lord, here I am. What do you want me to do? Right? Now, a lot of people don't want to know what the Lord wants them to do. <laughs> they just want to show up and just go, I'm here. Right? But that's not good either. If you want the Lord, the Lord to work in our families and in our work, we need to fight against lukewarmness. Fight against lukewarmness. What do you mean by fight against lukewarmness? Because it sets in. It sets in very easily in our lives. It sets in because the culture of our world, a lot of ways dictate how we behave. And we have to fight. We have to be like the uh, counterculture in a sense. Well, if the culture does this and the culture does that, you better believe it's probably the Lord wants you to do the quite opposite of that. (laughs) That's one way to measure it. If the culture wants to do this, a godless culture wants to do that, and this, you better believe, is probably the very opposite that the Lord wants you to do. But you don't need to look at just the culture. You need to just ask the Lord. 
Desire, the desire in our culture is to have full entertainment. What's the, what's, what's the biggest draw in churches? Entertainment. Yes. You know? yeah. Because of the virus, a lot of these churches have shut down for a long time. They haven't, they haven't opened for a while. But it was the entertainment, the desire to be entertained because this is what draws people in and keeps people in. Yeah. The only problem is if that's what you drew them in, that's what you got to keep doing to keep them in. Mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of a double-edged sword. Whatever you use to bring them in, it's what you got to use to keep them. Otherwise, yeah. as soon as something else changes, they go. Spoon feeding. Spoon feeding. Yeah, spoon feeding. That's right. It's so poisonous that Jesus says, be careful. There's warnings. It's a poison. How terrible will be for the Lord to step out of our lives in fellowship. And he's outside the fellowship. He's sitting outside, not wanting to participate in anything that we do. Remember, in the book of Judges, the Lord departed from Samson, and he didn't even know. He didn't even know that the Lord, that the Spirit of God had left him. You know, he always said, I'm going to break loose out of this, just like all of the times. But he didn't know that the Lord had departed from him. And it was too late. And the Philistines jumped on him, and that was the biggest thing. Now, when Jesus was at his Passover dinner, when Jesus was at his Passover dinner, and he left the Passover dinner, and he went toward the Garden of Gethsemane. After he finished the dinner, they sent a hymn, and they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was betrayed. When he was there, absolutely no doubt that the Lord left Jerusalem through the eastern gate, through the east gate. No doubt. Just the way you have to go through or toward uh, Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. Right, Mount of Olives... Just to the east of it, you would have gone through the eastern gate. Well, most, as we read it, most people forget that it is the same gate that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, left Jerusalem in the book of Ezekiel. When he left Jerusalem, it says he went toward the eastern gate. Ezekiel looked toward the eastern gate, and the Spirit of God, the, the glory of God, went toward the eastern gate, then went toward the Mount of Olives, right? And it kept going east and east until he saw it no more. It left. It left the temple. The glory of God departed. Now, what do we... In the book of uh, Samuel, it, it gives a word. There was a kid named that the glory has departed. Anybody know what that word is? Ichabod. Ichabod. The glory has departed. Remember, he had that son. Uh, Eli had the son. Or he had two sons. And he had daughters and uh, daughters-in-laws. And they had kids. But his kids were so corrupt, so evil, that they were killed. And then the ark was taken. And then one of the daughters-in-law had a baby, mm-hmm. right? And then had the son, and they called him Ichabod. The glory of the party because the ark was captured, right? And the glory of the Lord and Ezekiel kept going east and east, east through the eastern gate. Well, where did Jesus go? Through the eastern gate, out to the Mount of Olives, east, 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 kept going away. Now, how many people knew that Jesus was leaving Jerusalem? Not many. People didn't even know that the Lord had left Jerusalem. The disciples knew. That's about it. Well, how many people knew that Jesus was standing outside the church of Laodicea? Apparently nobody. (laughs) He had to knock and get their attention that he was outside. It's the same thing. Business as usual. (laughs) The Lord's outside, but the church keeps going. How do you have a church that keeps going with Jesus outside the church? How does the temple continue to function in the Old Testament without the glory of God? Impossible. Impossible. Impossible, but they made it happen, right? Meaning that it is possible... To have a form of religion. Traditions. Yeah. Denying the power of there. That's what Paul says. Denying the power. They don't have the glory. They don't have the power. Have a form of godliness, Paul says in Timothy. But denying the power of From such people stay away, Paul said. Right? The same kind of people in Laodicea, the same kind of people in Israel who just think, you know, being a Christian is having this comfortable lifestyle. And they didn't even know that God is not pleased with their lifestyle. You know, and obviously it's not just comfort. It's you know what breeds, it's contempt. What breeds is indifference, sin, right? Not serving the Lord, not being active, not being where well, your heart's not in it, and it goes on and on and on like that. Now I'm rich. Turn to Hosea chapter twelve, verse eight. I'm sorry, yeah, Hosea chapter twelve, verse eight. We're just about done. Hosea chapter twelve, verse eight. And somebody can turn to Amos 6.1. Amos 
Amos 6 1. Hosea 12 8. Yeah. And Ephraim said, Surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors they will find me. No iniquity which would be saved. Praise the Lord, I'm rich. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I'm rich. I'm good. Uh, no, I have no idolatry. Nothing. No iniquity. How do you say that? I mean, they were full of idolatry. I mean, the whole book of Hosea is about that. Twist Yeah. I have no sin. I have no problem. Right. Praise the Lord, I'm rich. Uh, Amos 6.1. Amos 6.1. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure in the mountain of Samaria. Yeah. Uh, um, this distinguished men of the foremost of the nation to whom the house of, the, of Israel comes. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Hosea says, thank God I'm rich. <laughs> have no iniquity. This is the beginning of the prosperity gospel. It didn't start yeah. back in the 1900s. It started way back in Israel. Mm -hmm. At the time of uh, Hosea, at the time of Amos. It was the beginning of it. I'm doing well. There must, this must be evidence of my spiritual life. Look how rich I am. I must be a real spiritual person. That's how they thought. That's how they thought that because they were so affluent and had a lot of money, that they were certain, certain that their spiritual state was right with the Lord. Uh, Luke 6.24, please. Luke 6.24. Somebody can read that. But woe to you that you are rich, for you have received your consolation. 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 Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who not mourn. Those who don't mourn. It says in another passage of scripture. Now what? Is God against happy? Is God, is God against happiness and is God against no. riches? No. No, of course not. But that's where wisdom and understanding come. Yeah. He's talking about the fact that people trust in those things. That, you know, you have no room for mourning in your life. You have no room. You don't mourn. You just always want to be happy. You always want to be happy. Always want to be happy. And so you push everything aside that doesn't cause you happiness. Even if it's trials, even if it's disruptions in your life. And woe to you who are rich. Well, that's a lot to us, to the, to the Western culture, right? Not to trust in it. Now, God has nothing to do with, you know, he's not against those who are rich. You know, Paul talks about those who... Um, who are wealthy to give, to, to give generously, those who have the gift of giving. But Paul also talks about that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Mm. That is the reality. And that's what woe to you rich means. It's when you become this attitude and behavior that you love money. When the Pharisees love money, it says in Luke. They love money. They love the affluence. They love their prestige, right? Um, here's Laodicea. Same way. Because you say I am rich, the Lord says, and have become wealthy. Well, the, the, the culture was that, exactly that. The culture demanded people to be well off because they live in a very prosperous society. And therefore the church had to become that. They weren't persecuted. Why weren't they persecuted? Why wasn't Laodicea persecuted? Not like Philadelphia or Smyrna. They weren't doing anything. Yeah, <laughs> they were just like the world. The society looked at them and they said, they're just like us. They're wealthy. They're rich. They're happy. They mix in. They mixed in. The mix is in. The mix was in. The mixture was on. It was so so on that they could not distinguish between the church and the world. You were just, you walked into the church. You might as well walk into a, a, you know, an arena or something. You know, you, you walked in, the, in a church. It's like walking into any organization that was in, uh, in Laodicea. Now, it says that you are wretched. You are wretched. It's a supreme, supreme example of wretchedness. It's being miserable. They didn't feel miserable. That's not what it's saying. They felt great. <laughs> but their condition was miserable. Mm -hmm. Right? They, they weren't going around, oh, we're so miserable. They actually were feeling really good about themselves. Mm -hmm. But Jesus says you're actually miserable. Right? Not subjective, but objectively. Subjectively, they felt great. I feel fine. Objectively, the Lord says, no, you're not. You are miserable. You are miserable because you have left things that you should have been doing already. You should have been hot or cold, but not mixed. Right? You're poor. 
There are two Greek words in the, that means poor. Uh, one means that you're poor because you paid everything off and you have money, you have no, no money to live on, but you pay all your debts. The second word means that you have absolutely destitute of anything. Absolutely nothing. That's what that word is here in the Greek. It means you have absolutely complete poverty. Complete poverty. And so um, it was used of Smyrna. The church of Smyrna, God says that they were poor. But he says, but you're rich in me. They were poor in this world. They, were, they didn't have any physical means. But they were rich in Christ to the church of Smyrna. Here, the Laodicea, they're poor. Because Jesus says, you're poor. You're actually bankrupt. Because you are wealthy, you are very rich, but you're actually poor. You're spiritually a pauper, right? You're blind. You're blind. There are none too blind that those who don't want to see. It's not that they were, you know, they could see physically. They had their faculties, but they couldn't see that Jesus was that side. Now, what does it take to see that Jesus was that side? It takes spiritualize. You're spiritualized, you just might as well be blind. Well, who else was blind? The Pharisees. Right? Remember the story, John 9, Jesus heals the, 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 the blind men? Right? But then he, he asked, you know, the, the guys asked him, who healed you? And I said, it was, it was some, some guy, he didn't even know who he was. Right? <laughs> he healed me. And he's like, well, he, he's, not, he's a sinner. And he's like, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know, but uh, I know I was blind and I didn't see him. Yeah. <laughs> I said, do you, want to, do you want to follow him? Do you want to be his disciples? And they threw him out. They threw him out of church. They threw him out of the synagogue. That's how blind they were. And it actually says Jesus looked for him. He sought. He sought for him. He went after him. That's the love of Christ. Yes. Even when nobody wants you, Jesus still wants you. Even when the church, the false church rejects you, Jesus will love you and get you back. Yes. You know, as you're talking about mixing and mixing and stuff like that. Yeah. That question when I, I, I text you the other day, I was like, man, like, what's the deal here? Why isn't Ezra doing what he's doing? Oh yeah. But it shows the it shows yeah. you know, the, the the importance of. You know what they did in mixing their, you know, marrying other, you know, yeah. having wives away, pagan wives, and what he called them to do. Yep. You know, it just shows it correlates with being lukewarm. Absolutely. You know what the I guess the uh, the consequences would be. Yeah. If we continue to mix their culture with the the pagans. Yeah. So that's a, that, that was something. Absolutely. Be careful with the culture. Don't let the culture dictate. Your faith. In fact, our faith should change the culture, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a culture that's sinful, that its behavior, it's anti-God, anti-Christ, then our faith and our testimony should be the influencing factor toward the culture. But here, the world got in. They were naked, it says. Now, they had wool. They had great clothing. You remember the black wool that I told you, the black sheep that they had? They had great clothing, but they have no covering. They had no covering. Um, when Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says they were naked. Now, they were physically naked already, right? They didn't have any clothes. They didn't need clothes at the time. But it was more than that. It was just more than a physical thing. It was the loss of their innocence. Mm -hmm. And because of sin, they now realize, yes. they lost it. They now realize that there's sin in their lives. And that's what made their nakedness even more apparent. What did the Lord do? He sacrificed an animal. Clothe them. They sat their own clothes, right? Fig leaves, right? Man is always trying to cover up their own work, their own works. But it takes a sacrifice, a blood that was shed to cover them. What was a picture of that? It's a picture of the eventual covering that we'll have. A sacrifice was made. The Lamb of God is sacrificed, and He covers us with His righteousness. Somebody turn to Isaiah sixty-one. Isaiah sixty-one ten. Beautiful verse. I think Mr. Alanda sings this song sometimes. Isaiah sixty-one ten. If somebody can read it. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress. And as a bride, bride adorns herself with her jewels. Amen. This is what the Lord's going to do. He's going to cover us with his garments of salvation. Nakedness in the Bible is having no salvation. It's having no salvation. You're naked. Just like Adam and Eve, they were naked. They were without righteousness. They were completely vulnerable because of sin. And God has to come and clothe them with the skin of the animal. An animal had to be sacrificed. An innocent one has to die for the sins of others and cover them. Well, God provides that. 
God provides now is righteousness. Jesus comes, dies on the cross for us, and let's not forget this, to pay for our sins, but to give us his righteousness. Yes. That's what happened at the cross. Don't ever, just, don't ever just think, well, he paid for my sins. But he did pay for your sins, but in order to cover that, he needed to give you his righteousness. He wipes away your sin, but he gives you his righteousness. His own righteousness covers you. Like a garment. That's when Paul is very emphatic in Colossians and Ephesians. Put on Christ. Put on the new man that is after Christ, right? Put off the old man. Take off the old clothes, put on the new clothes, right? Put off the old, nasty garments of sin, right? And deception that we had and put on Christ. Put on the garments of salvation. He has clothed me like a bride ready for her marriage. Remember brides when you got married? You decked out, ready to go, beautiful bride, right? Well, one day that bride is going to look marvelous. Paul says, I've been... I've been correcting you, Corinthians, because I want you to be like a chaste virgin, like a chaste bride, ready for her husband to come. He's, he's making her ready. And one day, she'll be decked out the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we'll see the Jerusalem coming down as a bride, Amen. as a bride adorned for her husband. Why? It's a picture of us. It's a picture of the city. The city and the bride become so indistinguishable between the two because that's where God's people are going to live. The bride and the city almost become the same thing as a reflection of the other. The bride is so perfect and beautiful and ready. The city reflects the beauty of her bride because it comes from heaven and we're going to be going to heaven too. It's, it's, it's a beautiful picture of not only the city, but us ready for our bridegroom, Jesus. But until then, he's got to get those garments clean. He's got to get those garments white. And that's the process that we're in today. He gives us those garments and he says we're to keep them white by the blood of the Lamb. Keeping them white by the blood of the Lamb. So Jesus said, I counsel you. I said, I advise you, verse 18, buy from me gold refined by fire that you may, come, that you may become rich. But that they were rich already. Mm-hmm. No, not that kind of rich. Yeah. Rich in Christ. Buy from me gold refined in the fire and white garments that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness may be revealed. And I saw to... Um, uh, an eye soft to anoint your eyes that you may see. I counsel you, says the Lord. I counsel you. Paul came to the churches and says, I plead with you. Please change. I love you. Times Paul, beloved, I admonish you. I, 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 I counsel you, Paul said to the churches over and over again, just like Jesus. I give you counsel. Buy from me gold. Now, how do you buy gold? Right? How do you buy gold from the Lord? What does that take? <laughs> How do you buy gold from the Lord? In Isaiah 55, it says, Buy gold from me without money and without price. Come and eat. Well, how do you buy gold without price <laughs> and without cost? Just receive it. Yes, it is a gift. But what's most precious than gold? Faith. Huh? Faith. Faith, yes. That's right. Faith refined in the fire like pure gold, right? He's talking about our faith, right? He's offering us something much better than gold, than physical gold. And that is faith. Gold refined in the fire is our faith, right? Buy from me gold. But buy it without cost. Buy it without money. Well, you don't need money to buy faith. <laughs> you don't need money to buy gold. It's received, like, Paul, like Anthony says. It's received. But you've got to get it from God. You've got to get it from God. You've got to get this gold. You've got to get the gold. You, you know, it's, there's a run on gold, I heard now. Gold and silver, like, there's nobody that has it. Oh, crazy. Well, yeah, it's crazy stuff, it's man. Crazy. It's, it's, it's a run on it, right? Yeah. But here God says, you need gold. Try it in the fire. Refine in the fire. Your precious faith is what you need more than anything today. I counsel you, says the Lord. I counsel you to get gold. I counsel you to clothe yourself. Buy some eyes off. Get it in your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. And be zealous, therefore, and repent. Does God still love them? Yeah. yeah. How do you know? Yeah, he does. See, love in a little bit of a Western culture mindset, love doesn't mean rebuke. Love means you give me anything I want. God's love is, no, if I love you, I am going to correct you. I correct my kids because I love them. If 
I didn't love them, I I wouldn't care what they did. I would be an irresponsible parent. And it's tough. It's tough. Because our our Western culture mindset is, you know, give kids whatever they want, and that's how you love them, buy them, buy them things, you buy their love. That's it. That's not the way you do it. That's not our Heavenly Father's uh, uh, process. He gives us what we need. And when we go astray, He reproves us because He loves us. Amen. Hebrews 13 says, why does He reprove us? And he, because He loves us, but He says, so we can share in His holiness. God wants us to be holy. Amen. God wants us to be holy. And um, man, the devil uh, wants us to stop seeking the Lord. The devil wants us yes, to stop praying and seeking the Lord. And that's where people go astray. It's emphatic here. God chastens those he loves and um, and you could say man I'm in a trial I'm in a difficulty it's got to be the devil right because we know the devil's against us right it's got to be the devil may not be the devil might be the Lord every time I go into a trial or some difficulty in my life I always got to ask myself the same question Lord or not me, but I asked the Lord, Lord, did I, did, I, did I offend you? Did I sin against you, Lord? I always got to check myself. Why? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not above the law. I'm not above anything. I can fall in sin just like any one of us. Right? And maybe the Lord correcting me. Lord, did I, am I living in a way that is not pleasing to you? Right? And we are tested, Hebrew says, so we can share in his holiness. God wants us to be holy. In fact, God wants us to be holy not just, whole, not, not just happy, but holy. People want to be happy here, right? Mm-hmm. There's a saying here, people want to be happy here, holy later, right? Mm-hmm. They want to be happy in this world and holy in the next world. Well, it doesn't work like that. God wants us to be holy here, then we will be happy there. Mm-hmm. Holy in this world, happy in the next world. People want to take it the other way. They want to be happy here, then they'll think about holiness later. No, no, no. <laughs> Hebrew says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So you wouldn't have to worry about being happy. You won't see the Lord. Unless you're holy, you won't see the Lord. Unless you're growing in holiness, you won't see the Lord. And now holiness doesn't mean, you know, put on a black robe, suck on lemon, and live in a mountain. That does not mean holiness in any way, shape, or form. In fact, you can't be holy by yourself. You have to be holy toward others. First Thessalonians says you have to be holy toward other people and respect them, respect their bodies, respect, their, uh, respect them as a, a, as a sister in the Lord, a brother in the Lord. Respect one another, defraud one another in that way. That's how holiness works. Mm-hmm. You keep each other, you keep you keep pure. You keep each other uh, pure in that way. You keep yourself pure. You keep others pure. That's holiness. Holiness toward the Lord. That's one Amen. part of being holy. It's being set apart by God. Holiness, Amen. holiness toward the Lord. So holiness here, happiness in the next life. Mm-hmm. May not be all happy here. Believe me. There's some dreadful things that are going on in this world and dreadful things that are coming on this world. But we can be holy. And that's what God wants. Without holiness, we won't see the Lord. Remember, you can still have joy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Remember, Jacob spent 20 years with Laban. 20 years serving Laban. Uh, But he was being transformed by God through all those years of difficulties until he finally met the Lord at the brook of Jabin. And he wrestled with God, and he became Israel, right? It took a while, but God wanted to make him holy. God wanted to make him holier than he was, right? And um, I saw for your eyes, right, so to, to he could see. So he could see. All this is a response to the mercy of God. God wants a response. Did you notice that there? He's giving them all this. He's doing this. He's telling them you need to do this so they can respond. And it's all because of mercy, it's all because of mercy. Right? The grace of God teaching us to deny ungodliness. That's what he wanted from Laodicea. Verse 19, those whom I love are disciplined. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down on my father and his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's the invitation. I am knocking at the door. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I am knocking at the door. The ones who announce himself, the Lord of glory, you know, he's not begging, but his authority is, let me in. Let me in. Wake up. If anyone hears my voice, 
An individual, just one, just one, if anyone. He doesn't need the whole church to respond. Just, just needs one person in this whole culture of entertainment and affluence to come out and say, Lord, is that you? Now think of Jesus in his desperation to get people out of there, yeah. right? If they don't, um, if they don't respond, then the Lord's not coming in. Right? If they don't respond, the Lord's not coming in. He's not going to, he, he's standing at the door and he knocks and he's waiting for an answer. What is the answer for? Fellowship. He says, if anyone, I will come in to him and dine with him. Fellowship. Again, fellowship with the Lord. It's the most the strongest, strongest element of love. Right? The strong yeah. rebuke is an evidence of his love. Right? He loves us more than we love ourselves. He loves us more than we love ourselves. And I think for sure we love ourselves pretty much a, a lot, right? Amen. Yet He loves us more. He loves us more than we love ourselves. And He won't leave us. He won't leave us on, his, on our own. He wants to get us back. He's willing to knock on that door Amen. of that church, right? Now, some people have said this is applied to evangelism. I, I, I don't have a problem people use it as an evangelistic tool. God stands at the door of your heart and He knocks. And if anyone opens the door, He'll come in and have a relationship with them. That's true. If somebody... somebody not a believer, opens their heart to call on the Lord, the Lord will come in by His Spirit and make that person born again if they repent. There's no doubt about it. But in context, there's no doubt this is speaking to the church. This is speaking to believers who have backslid away from Christ. And there's an opportunity for the church to come back to the Lord. But He says, I'll take anyone. I will take anyone. Mm -hmm. For sure, this is about the church. Can you hear His voice? John 10, if you hear His voice, you're his sheep. If you hear his voice, you're his sheep. So the sheep have stopped listening to the Lord. That's, that's what the other side of the story is. Yes, if anyone hears, yes, it's true. But what about the rest of them? Why aren't they listening? Right? They're not listening to the Lord. They're not listening to the Lord. But if you do, the Lord says, if you listen to me, I will come in. And there's a destiny. Look at the destiny. I will grant them, if you overcome, if you overcome lukewarmness, if you overcome being Laodicea, I will not only have fellowship with you, right? right? Fellowship, he's the manna, he's the living water, the Lord's Supper, right? Fellowship with Christ. But if anyone op opens that door, fellowships with him, and he overcomes the complacency, overcomes Laodiceanism. That's another word. If you overcome Laodiceanism, that he will reign with him. Look at the promises. I will, uh, you will sit with me on my throne. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes. To the most backslidden, gone church, these are the most strongest promises. If you overcome, you'll sit on my throne. Mm -hmm. What did they do to deserve this? <laughs> Nothing. <clears throat> They're actually very sinful, very despicable. But God is able to redeem the worst of us yes. and give us a new life. And if we repent, we will sit with him. Grace. Yes, grace. grace. Amazing grace. How could it be that you, my king, would die for me, right? Absolutely grace. Absolutely grace. Jesus told his disciples that he will give them the kingdom. And they will rule over the tribes of Israel. Now, they were just a bunch of fishermen, zealots, and tax collectors. A bunch of ruffians. Two sons of thunder. One, like a borderline terrorist. One was a thief, was, you know, basically a tax collector. Bunch of fishermen. What do they do to deserve such great honor, to rule over the tribes of Israel? Great. Grace. Simple grace. Paul says, and the least of all the saints, yet to me has been given to me. Grace. <laughs> the least of all, Paul says, born out of due time. He's got grace. <laughs> he persecuted the church. He was a blasphemer. What did the Lord, Lord chose him? Grace. Out of mercy. He who has an ear, let him hear. Hearing is not completely, it's not completed until you have done it. That's the idea of hearing. Mm -hmm. Hearing is not completed until you have done it. It's not a matter of just, oh, I listened to Jesus. No, I know I listened to Jesus when I did, when I do what he told me to do. That's hearing. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Hearing is not completed until you do what he said. You might have heard him. Oh, I heard something. Maybe his voice or whatever. But it's not completed. It's not total hearing until you have done it. Right? God doesn't hear the prayer of some. It doesn't mean God doesn't know the prayer. It just means God won't act on the prayer right, of some. Right? Now, God knows everyone's prayer. 
He knows everything, but he doesn't hear our prayers. What does that mean? It means he won't act on it, right? Yeah. Depending on certain situations, he won't act on it, right? Because the nature of the prayer, people respond, people pray selfishly. God won't respond to that. Now, he heard it, he just won't respond. That's what it means. When God doesn't hear a prayer, it's not that he, I can't hear anything. No, it's, I won't do it. I won't complete what you asked me to do, right? And just to finish off, it says, you will reign on my throne I will also, as I also overcame and sat down on my Father's throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What an ending to the most backslidden church that will sit with Christ on his throne because they overcame. And the idea here is no doubt in the book of Revelation, when you read it all, a Christian is an overcomer. An overcomer. Yeah. Yep. We might have to change the name now Overcomers. in our culture, yeah. Because a Christian is everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's a Christian, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Politicians are Christians, they say. Right? I, I don't believe most of them are, but some of them may be, right? But I do know this. A Christian is an overcomer. An overcomer is a Christian. We might have to change the name in the last days to say, are you an overcomer? <laughs> Are you overcoming sin in your own life? And if you're overcoming sin in your own life, you will overcome this world because he has overcome. Our faith will help us overcome the world, Amen. John says. Our faith. Amen. What overcomes the world? Our faith. Because Jesus did it. And he overcame. And gave it, he gave his life. And he is the truth. And he says here, he who overcomes. We need to overcome Laodicea. My dear brothers and sisters, we need to overcome Laodicea in our own hearts. And we're in a very dangerous situation because we live in the most affluent country in the world. Yes. And that culture seeps in to churches, to our hearts. And it's very, very difficult to not to be affected by it. And there's got to be a fight in our own hearts. We need to fight for, fight for our faith, fight for contend for the faith, but fight against lukewarmism in our own souls and hearts. Yes. Now I'll give you one example where we fall into lukewarmness and we'll be done. This is very practical because I wanted to give something practical at the end. Your prayer life. Mm-hmm. Our prayer life can become lukewarm. Yes. And what I mean by that, we've all struggled in it at some point or another. I'm no better than you. Mm-hmm. I struggle in prayer life. I've been hurt. I've done a lot of things against me and things like that and I've had a lot of prayers that are not answered. And when that time comes and those things come, I get this really discouraged. Mm-hmm. And then I falter in prayer, meaning I don't persist in it. I, I give up. I struggle in it mm-hmm. because of the hurt, because of not, being, not having the answers that I thought the Lord was going to answer. And all these stuff go through your head and you become discouraged. And nothing changes. And we're disappointed. And then lukewarmness sets in. Yes. Meaning it's not that we don't know that we need to pray, it's just that we don't really care too much about praying or we're not fervent in prayer anymore. Yes. We might go through the motion, don't get me wrong, we don't want to look unspiritual at church. We might go through the motion, but really our hearts are not in it because of the hurt, because of the disappointment. We realize that, yes, we ought to pray more, but we're just not interested in it. We're indifferent toward it. And this happens to a lot of us because we know we have to pray for one another. Did a whole message for the men, right, about prayer and intercession. We know we have to pray for one another. But when we are absent and pull away because of hurts or because of problems or because of issues in our own personal life, then we don't persevere in prayer. And then that, that lukewarmness sits in, that non-caring attitude, you know. We still go through the motion, believe me, we do. But there's no power in it. There's no prayer. There's no fervency in it. There's no hot. <laughs> there's no cold, you know, yeah. usefulness in prayer. Yeah. It simply is, we just pray, but see no end to our prayer. We see no result to our prayer. And that's lukewarmness. But we must realize the danger of lukewarmness in our prayer life. That we need to persist in prayer. We need to know that prayer is very humbling, by the way. Yes. Prayer is very humbling. Why? You won't notice, you won't get noticed if you pray a lot. Put it that way. You won't get noticed if you pray a lot. Not many people are going to notice you, right? If you're seeking attention, that's not a good ministry to get into. (laughs) If you're seeking attention, 
there's no glory in prayer, right? There's no glory in prayer because it's God. It's a humility. It's a dependency on God completely. That's why it's hard to pray sometimes because it's a total dependency on God and nobody's going to get the glory, right? I can preach a message and people can see me up there on the camera and, oh, look at him, he's up there preaching. I like what he said. But if you pray, don't get no, you won't get noticed. It's a humility. It's a dependency on God. In our prayers, sometimes when we pray, there's delays. God delays. And our hearts get warm because we don't see the answer. And there needs to be discipline in prayer. Amen. Right? There needs to be discipline in prayer. And um, there's a need for the Master, for the Lord, to guide us in our prayer and to guide our prayers. And this is where we lose our fervency, right? And uh, we give up. And we give up praying. And when we give up praying, it shows that our hearts, um, that shows our hearts. It shows where our hearts really are in a lukewarm state when we give up on prayer. And this is why I encourage you guys. It's one way, it's a barometer to see if we've fallen into lukewarmness. Just look at your prayer life. Have we given up? Have we grown discouraged? Not praying for others? We know we ought to. We know we need to. Pray for circumstances? Absolutely. But we get hurt, we get discouraged, and we give up. And that right there, you can point it out, and the Lord can see it. Yeah. And He points us out and says, mm, lukewarmness. There's a measure of lukewarmness. Not me, Lord. Not me. I don't want to be allowed to see you. I'm not, I, I read the whole thing. That's not me. Be careful, remember? It's a blindness. It's a spiritual blindness that comes. And we don't see it until the Lord points it out. But once he points it out, yes, sir. It's funny because it, when you're saying that, it re reminds me of when I had to get a, a food handler's card and they teach you about the danger of bacteria growth on oh, yeah. certain temperatures of food. Oh, we yeah. have refrigerations, refrigerators to keep the food cold and it slows down the bacteria growth so it keeps yeah. it from being really bad, Yes. or you heat food up to a certain degree where it kills the bacteria, yes. but if right there there is a danger zone, which is lukewarm, it actually will kill a person. Yes, it can. It botulism, it. yeah, botulism. it's weird how the Lord, the Lord you know, yeah. even with our food, it teaches us what That's not so to true. be. That's so true. That's so true. Uh, you're absolutely right. Now... Why did Jacob, what did God bless Jacob? We talk about Jacob and Laban, right? It's been for 20 years. God bless Jacob. Why would God bless Jacob? He wouldn't give up. Yeah. He lied. He cheated. He manipulated. Sounds like a lot of people I know. Sounds like me. Uh, he lied. He's cheated. He struggled, right? He, he wasn't a good guy. In fact, we probably would have run away from him. We probably didn't, wouldn't want Jacob in our church, right? But he wouldn't give up. He dealt with God. He dealt with his fears. He dealt with his hurts. He dealt with everything about it. And he would not let go of the Lord. Right? Know this. The struggle is going to be real. It's going to be a really part of our walk. It's going to be real. And the desire to break away from prayer and lukewarmness, it's going to be there. Right? But he didn't give up at all. All the insecurities and all the problems Jacob had, he held on to the Lord. Did you ever see Esau pray? No, he didn't. One of the major differences. But Jacob sought the Lord, it says. And at the brook of Penuel, at the brook of Javid and Penuel, he wrestled with God until God said, Okay, I'll give you the answer. I will give you your answer prayer. Don't, I won't let go until you bless me, Jacob said. I won't let go until you bless me. I think we should do the same. Or I'm not letting go of this prayer. I'm not letting go until you answer. I'm not letting it go. No matter the problems, the insecurities, and difficulties, I'm not letting go, right? And he sought the Lord, and God answered. And he made him rely on the Lord. Remember, he changed his name to Israel, dislocated his hip socket, and he had to become relying on the Lord. He leaned on his staff from that, mo that point forward. Same thing for us. God will even use our weaknesses in our prayer to get us to rely on Him. But to, don't let go, right? Maybe you're discouraged and it's hard to pray, but yeah. God is teaching you something in that. And there's a struggle in prayer. Amen. There's a struggle. At least you're hot. <laughs> At least you're cold. At least you're being useful in your prayer life.
by praying and not giving up. But as soon as we give up, just imagine what Joel said, that bacteria, that lukewarmness sets in. It's lethal because it sets in and, and that desire is going to be there. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us in our prayer life, to help us in our lukewarmness because it could set in, my friend, and sets in in all of us. Yeah, we can laugh, but not laugh, but we can mourn over Laodicea. We can make jokes about the fallen church and the fallen away church. And we can see the problems with the prosperity gospel and people that have gone away. But what about us? What about my lukewarmness? I know their lukewarmness. I got to get it right. And I have to fight against my own lukewarmness. That's what the church of Laodicea, the letter to the church of Laodicea was written. So we can know how to prevent it. We can know how to prevent it. Lord, thank you for the time that we've had together. We praise you and honor you for all that you've done, for all that you have done and all that you will do. Lord, like Jacob, we plead, Lord, not to let us go. Lord, even when we want to let go, please, Lord, hold on, hold on to us. Remind us of the time that we need in prayer. Remind us, Lord, of the very need and the substance in prayer. Lord, it's you and you alone. Lord, it's humbling. Yes. Prayer is humbling. Yes. Because it's completely out of our control. Yes. It's totally relying on you. And Lord, I have to admit that there has been lukewarmness in my own heart, Lord. Yes. For the lack of prayer on certain things that we have given up because of our own hurts, yes, our own past experiences. And maybe even, Lord, our own impatience that you haven't answered and therefore we grow discouraged. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I know the enemy works very deeply in the hearts of those who have been hurt, in the hearts of those who have seen no answer in prayer. And Lord, I ask you this evening that you forgive us, Lord, for our lukewarmness in prayer Mm -hmm. or fellowship or our reading of Scripture, our devotional life, our service to you. And Lord, cause us, Lord, to renew us, Lord. And there'll be a renewal in the spirit, Lord God, of our commitments that we made, of prayer, fellowship, serving you, the word of God. Lord, we ask you by faith, believing that you will answer us. And like Jacob, Lord, we won't let go. We want to persist, Lord, until we see your will being done. Lord, your will may be no, but at least we know it's now. At least we're fervent in prayer. At least we're continuing on. For Lord, you will give us all good things. Lord, as we seek you, you will give us the things that we need. Amen. And so, Father, we pray that in amen. Jesus' name, the amen of God, that your promises, yes, Lord, are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, under his authority, we ask that these prayers, Lord God, that are deep within us, Lord, will come under the authority of Jesus, Lord. And he will decide what to do with those prayers. But Lord, keep us praying. Keep us holding on to you. That no lukewarmness will set in. That no indifference, Lord, will set in. There'll be a fervency, Lord. Hot, a cold, um, usefulness, refreshing, a desire, Lord, to bless others and refresh others, Lord. Lord, we ask you that you will do that in us. As we hold on to you, the grace of God, to deny ungodliness and to deny the worldliness will be there with us, Lord. Bless my brothers and sisters here, Lord. Help them to cry out to you with a pure heart, Lord God. Lord, that you hate mixture. You don't want us to be mixed in the world, but you said to come out of the world. Yes. And Father, I pray you point the things out in our lives that have become faulty and worldly. And you would give us, Lord, what we need. More of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you.